Okay, good morning, kia ora. Kia ora koutou. welcome to everyone at our Gisborne District Council meeting today. I'm going to ask Councillor Farehinga to open with Karakia, and then we'll get right into what is going to be a very busy day. Thank you, Councillor Farehinga. Morena, thank you, Your Worship. Ni noi tato. Manawa mai ia te pūtanga o Matariki, manawa mai ia te ariki o te rangi, manawa mai ia te mātahi o te tau. Fano, fano, haramai te toki, atahu ākirangi, haumi e hui e tae ki e. Celebrate the rising of Matariki, celebrate the Lord, Lord of the skies, celebrate the coming of the new year, unite, unite and bring forth the dawn, together in unison, we are one. Kia ora tātou. Kia ora, thank you for that. So let us get right into our agenda for today. We can see that some illness and travel interruptions are taking some of our colleagues to, away today. I have Councillor Parata, I have Councillor Ria. Apologies for have I forgotten anyone? And Councillor Tibble. Moved by Councillor Farahinga, seconded by Councillor Cranston. All in favour, country carries. Declarations of interest, there will be quite a few declarations today. We've got a massive agenda. I am declaring my interest as a trustee of Trust Rafati, which we'll get to later. Any other conflicts as we go through items, please make sure you speak up at that time and the chair with you will then make appropriate considerations on participation and voting. So just a, a clear reminder for everyone, we have seen some issues in the national media where people think they don't have a conflict or might not declare. It is really important, even if it's a perceived conflict of interest, that you just raise it and it is noted. And like I'm saying, at every item, if you realize, let us know, better safe than sorry. Okay, councillors, let's open our agenda. I take you to page four. Everyone had the opportunity, Annie sent these quite some time ago for everyone to put their eyes over our minutes. Page four to seven, any questions, queries? If not, do I have a mover of the minutes of our council meeting held on the 18th of May? Moved by councillor Foster, seconded by councillor Robinson. All in favor, contrary carried. I do take you to page eight, which is our action sheet. Anything anyone wants to raise in regards to our action sheet? If not, I move on to leave of absence. No one there. Any acknowledgements or tributes that I should be aware of? I do want to take this opportunity and I think I'm going to stand up. Our region has been through one of the toughest times since January of this year. And I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge volunteers in our regions, in our region, other organizations fire and police, ambulance, our rescue helicopter, our hospital, um, iwi partners, hapu leads, everyone who go out of their way to bring a combined effort and support civil defense and what we've seen this year. It's heartbreaking to see the devastation on the ground. Um, it is heartbreaking to visit Fano, whose houses are affected and who are hurting at this stage. Um, our infrastructure, which was already so fragile, are absolutely devastated by what we've seen in February and March, but also what we've seen in the last week. So I just want to take this opportunity, acknowledge it's a community wide, it is our region standing together. And we are tired of everyone saying, oh, you guys are so resilient. Um, our region needs all the support it can get. We are having discussions with government as we speak, how that recovery look, how we support our category two and category three homes, homeowners and help them to rebuild for them also a safe fuddy where at night when it's rain, when it's raining, they feel safe in their fuddy 
and everyone doesn't sleep with one eye open. So just from us here at the Gisborne District Council, but I'm sure also civil defense, thank you for all the volunteers, everyone out there doing their bit because civil defense is a community effort and everyone plays a role. So thank you for that. Yes. I'd like to just add to that because I've been heavily involved over the last couple of weeks. Top of the list, we have to put GDC staff, the effort they've put in here and the, the work that they've had to do, I think that the acknowledgements of the GDC staff need to be at the top of that list. Thank you for that, Councillor Cranston. Much appreciated and you will pass that on to your staff as well, Nikki. Okay, we have moved into the public section of um, our morning where the public can come and talk to us. We have two deputations today and I'll just clarify how it works. So first we're gonna invite our lovely crew over there, Renee and Harley, who's gonna talk about the Topic Exchange Cafe. So I'm gonna invite you to sit here next to me. We'll turn on the microphone and we'll leave it on. Give you about five minutes to chat. Deputations are the public talking to us and us listening. People can ask a, a question of clarification, but this is not a debate or um, this is us listening to you, giving you the opportunity to talk to us. So we are going to invite Harley and Renee, please come and join us. Um, got about five minutes and then we will move to Comet who will join us then at the front. Thank you, please take a seat. You can just leave your microphone on. It picks up there. I'll turn one. Uh, Morena Koto. Um, so my name is Harley, and I um, am here with Renee uh, Raroa to talk about the Exchange Cafe, which is a new um, opportunity to support regional conversations about uh, climate solutions. Um, but before we start, we'll just introduce ourselves and Renee, would you like to? <clears throat> yeah, Morena Koto. Ko Renee Rado, Tōku Ingwa, Ngāti Pro, Norangi Tukia, live here in, um, in Tūranga Nui Akiwa. Um, yes, like Ali said, here to present um, the Exchange Cafe Kopapa today. Um, and just to bring some clarity around, um, you know, because we all wear so many different hats. Um, the Exchange Cafe is a platform for conversations. Um, this is complementary to, but separate from and different from um, the East Coast Exchange, which some of you might have um, engaged with or seen. If you haven't, um, please do so. Uh, but yeah, the, just to give you some separation of those two, Kopapa East Coast Exchange um, is a platform for payments for um, activities in the tile. Um, and the Exchange Cafe is a platform for discussions toward climate solutions. Bye. Cool. Okay, so, oh, if we could just, um, oh. Ah, thank you. Okay. Cool, um, just while Harley's doing that, I guess um, before we start, what we would like for you to keep in mind as we go through um, this presentation is that um, the key bits that we invite you guys to consider here is how you might see yourself participating in this platform. Um, also to consider this platform as a resource to um, hear from various parts of the community, as many as possible is our hope, um, and how, if at all, you might want to use the platform so we're open um, and welcome your engagement post this session um, to, yeah reach out to us if there's a way that you spot you might want to use this. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and I mean, I guess the key thing here is that um, climate solutions are um, getting to a, a state of um, deca decarbonised and resilient communities uh, is, is not uh, the role of one agency. It's a, we need to have these regional conversations to support um, that journey. Uh, for our region, so this is a this is a an opportunity to, to support those regional conversations that we that we need to have. Um, so nuts and bolts. Oh, can you oh, see that's like a little bit weird, but that's all right. I'll um, just look at my notes here. Yeah. So it, there you go, Helen. So essentially, we're setting up a um, 
working with production companies to support um, conversations, basically, the opportunities to have panel discussions on key challenges and opportunities in the climate um, space. <coughs> and so there's multiple sort of opportunities here, connecting with community conversations, con connecting with community events, um, but also connecting with, um, with experts inside and outside of the region to, to discuss the challenges and work on potential funding and um, solutions mm. for our region. Yeah, and I suppose what we spotted is that, you know, more and more these conversations where we're forming solutions and ideas forward for the region, they need to actually happen um, wider and with engagement opportunity by more and more people because more and more people are becoming aware of the, um, what that means for them. And so we know that these convos are happening, sometimes in rooms, um, sometimes public events, but that a relatively small proportion of the community actually gets opportunity or engages. Um, we want to take some steps, and this isn't going to go all the way, but take some steps toward opening those conversations up, having them re recorded, available as a resource um, to, to draw on, and um, where we can, as, a, as expertise is around the table, draw out those solutions further so, so um, we can activate more of the community to, to start to do, do some mm. things, I suppose. Um, really importantly, we want to make, make sure we acknowledge that each community, probably each household actually, is going to need to have their own unique solutions. Um, so that's a big piece of the design of this platform. Um, and we're going to um, need to do our best to kind of reach out into all of the community. So we'll be using existing networks. If you guys are um, keen for us to, you know, reach out to any communities in particular as well, but we'll, we'll do our best to ensure that the service is um, offered across Tairapiti. You're seeing like two bits of our slide. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. About that. Um, we'll do that through targeted comms and through kind of relationship, a relationships-based approach. Um, one of the things that's really important is that we reach uh, and have the opportunity for discussions as they as they want them to be recorded in, um, and shared in our smaller communities as well. Uh, so we'll have, um, we're partnered with Dangai and um, T. Wells's organisation, but we want to ensure that we're partnered with enough production orgs that we can send people out into all of the smaller communities too. Um, at the Mana Whenua conversation around any kind of tile and climate solution forming obviously is, um, is the most and one of the key voices that needs to be heard and shared in this space, but we're really also really conscious of how those data, how those conversations, how the information, the data and the matauranga that's shared is held. And so that will always be done um, in the way that um, the sharers of those data want it to be. That's just an important point for us to mm. make. And we have <clears throat> half a slide. Oh no, almost, almost a whole slide for this one. Um, so this was just to highlight that um, there's so many um, aspects of this climate um, discussion and, um, and they're all interconnected or there are lots of connections. Um, so we're looking to sort of theme up the discussions um, so we can have you know, a meaningful way forward with a, with a bunch of these sort of topic areas. Um, many, many of them obviously connect with um, council programs and priorities. Um, some don't. So there's, it's just acknowledging that there's um, lots of agencies and communities um, perspectives on, on these um, topics. Yeah, so we've already started to do some recordings of public events. There's been a couple um, last month that we live streamed and recorded. Uh, but that, this idea of having a calendar of, every, of all of the public events that are going on and then adding to that um, is, is what the Exchange Cafe is about. There's some examples there of what other events might be, but essentially we will 
uh, be watching the scene really across the region. We know that that shifts and changes, so we have to be quite dynamic in the approach. Um, and as things pop up, uh, we'll be keeping an eye out for those and then offering the service really. Like I know there's an event happening on Sunday. Um, the offer from the Exchange Cafe is to go, hey, do you guys, would you like that recorded as a resource for your participants? Mm. Um, we can come down, record that and put it on the platform. Uh, yeah, like I said, we've partnered with a few local partners. If you go to the next slide, it might show the we list. Show the top of the um, uh, but, and one of the quite cool things here is that um, with Dangai's partnership, I've got the EIT students um, in there. And so part of the idea is that they'll send the students out to capture those convos as well. Um, like I said at the beginning, there's a pathway here to the East Coast Exchange where that platform can provide an opportunity for people to list the solution taking the actions that they are um, taking and have that if they need it to be have that attract funds to them so if you uh, haven't seen it already if you go to the east coast exchange you'll be able to see a map view there of where all the contributions we're seeing happen across the community it's an open source platform it's just in its early days um, we'll probably come back to present for that probably at some time Okay. <clears throat> I'm sorry about these slides, but the uh, <laughs> we just we had a um, a slide just showing the sort of support network of agencies and community groups that have um, that we've been talking to and that have um, signalled an, an interest in participating and supporting the conversations, giving up their time and um, some uh, funding funding opportunities as well. So there's um, a lot of willingness to get in behind the, um, the platform and to uh, support these regional conversations. Um, so yeah, we just wanted to come and uh, give Thank you sure. that. And I guess, um, intro. what's the timeline? Mm. That might be a question. Um, mm. We have been aiming for Matariki, of course. It's yes. the perfect uh, time to do a few things. So in the next couple of weeks, we should have the platform up and live and available with its first content. You'll keep us updated. Yes. yes. Awesome. Thank you for that. One question, Councillor Robinson. Thanks. It's really, really exciting um, and well overdue. Um, who's going to sort of monitor or police it so it doesn't become a, a, a melting pot for keyboard warriors, but in fact is an effective tool? Mm, yeah, well, the design of it will essentially be a curated um, or a list of the recordings that we are managing the flow of and putting them up there but it is really important that that platform is as open as possible as many people as possible so it'll come down to the design of how we do the platform and have the um you know request for uh things to be shared in there sorted um harley has some capacity as well to be working on, on that so yeah, 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 and we we have already have some budget to support, um, yeah, some comms comms support to manage the social media side of things. So yeah, um, but you're right, yeah. that's that's an important piece for us to yeah, keep an eye. Yeah, yeah. Hey, thank you guys. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Next, I'm going to welcome Rochelle and the team from Com Comets. We can have more chairs here, or or just you and Craig. There we go. Two chairs. You can leave the microphone on. You've done this before. You can leave the microphone on. And yes. What are you doing? Oh, thank you, Colin. Uh, morning, everyone. Thank you for allowing Comet to come in here and speak today and present this petition on behalf of our community here in Tairawhiti. This petition was not started by Comet, it was started by a lovely local lady called Tessa Wilson. She's a teacher at Nauria Maui here in Tairawhiti. Hindsight is a wonderful thing. And we realized the only way we could have won this tender was to get a professional tender writer. We did try to do this, but the three people that we contacted or companies we contacted didn't have the capacity to help us at the time. 
It's unfortunate that we won't get another chance to do this for possibly nine years. It's not like other tenders where if you miss out, there's another one around the corner and you can apply for that. We are proud of the tender we delivered and we realize that it fell short of Belgravia Leisure's professionally written tender. I dispute a comment said by the panel that Belgravia Leisure could deliver more for our community. Wasn't gonna cry. We have already delivered much more than they ever will and we will continue to do so. Buy local, support local is always what we hear in here in Gisborne, especially from the council. Supporting an international company where you can be sure that part or most of their profits will go abroad. Belgravia Leisure is not invested in Tairafati. There are thousands of comments in this petition that you can all read. I've got a couple here that I just wanted to share with you. This one is from Liz Tozer. Learn to swim is a life skill and not a saleable, saleable commodity for overseas the overseas based corporates to make profits off our children needing the skill for life. Leave this provision of learn to swim to locals. Next one is from Mo Reedy. We elect the mayor and council to act responsibly and to make the right decisions on our behalf. They have not done this. Supporting locals should have been and should always be at the forefront of their decision making. If there are no local options, then national businesses surely could, should come next for consideration. The decision needs to be reviewed and a full explanation as to why and how this has happened. Last one here is from Kirsty Barber. It is vital to support local people and local businesses for communities to thrive, especially in these tough economic times. Social procurement is a vital strategy for councils to truly serve their communities. Enough of corporate greed and exploitation for profiting from communities. The support we have received, that Comet have received, has been absolutely amazing. It's lifted us up during this really disappointing time. The support has been widespread. Our community right up Coast Highway 35 has been just humbling and beautiful all the way to Matawai and down to Moody Wai Wairoa where people travel to come to Comet has been wonderful. And it's been nationally as well because lots of people that grew up in Gisborne don't live here and they live around. And it's been wonderful. Tairafti has made us feel very valued and treasured. Uh, the council procurement policy says it should consider community views. This was not done. We have the pleasure of submitting here for you guys, 4,577 names of people in support of comment. This and on behalf of council, we receive your petition. Thank you. And thank you for coming to talk to us today. And um, as you know, this is a forum where we listen. I don't know if there are any questions from councillors, but I do know there are some requests for information that are still being worked with by um, staff and I will get back to you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, councillors, I just want to quickly ask the CEO about an email that I received this morning about a three, do you want it, us to move something in the agenda earlier? I see a vet at the back. Um, is there something, just for timing of government hearings, we might quickly just have a discussion about how we shuffle our agenda so that a vet can get feedback before she goes. Is that what we, uh, is that what the email was about? Uh, yeah. Okay. So let me just look at our papers. It is 186. So councillors, I'm gonna ask you all with your permission that we shuffle our agenda a little bit to accommodate a vet talking to us about this before she goes on a national government um, 
Zoom. Kapai Ivit, I'm going to ask you to, it is 186, the Water Services Entities Amendment Bill. And um, thank you for the very informative information. And councillors will talk a little bit about this um, as well, because Nadine and I have also had the opportunity to catch up with our neighbours in Hawke's Bay and had a hui with all the mayors and CEOs of those um, people that are now part of Entity F, which we are. So, Yvette, I'm just going to pass over to you to give us a quick update and then let us know um, what you need out of us, and then you can sure. go to your hui. So there is, a, there is a presentation, and apologies, I've put a bit of pressure on Heather by just sending it now, so we'll just wait and see if that comes through, but I'll just talk to it anyway. Um, so the, um, the Water Services Entities Amendment Bill um, has been come out, and it, it, it's, it came out last week, or very, very recently anyway, and so we've done our best to, to scramble some um, points together, building on the presentation we did to you in May, um, which was a really, really broad overview of what the government was considering. Um, as you know, with legislation, um, there's a few potential fish hooks and the devil's in the details. So the, the process is about trying to iron that stuff out. Government's left itself a really, really short window for this. The submission's closed next Friday. So it's, um, I was watch. Now I'm going to show how much of a geek I am. I was watching Parliament TV yesterday and um, the, um, all of the parties other than Labour were trying to get the date changed um, so, um, so that it could be more democratic in terms of giving people the opportunity to really consider what these um, things are. But it is what it is and um, we're going to make a really good submission. <laughs> so the focus, I just want to remind you that these four pieces of legislation come out um, in this sort of in the last 12 months. Um, this one is amending the initial one that came out in December, which was focused on governance um, arrangements and accountability. Uh, and so these are the things that we've raised through, around those matters over time. And I suppose um, in um, the key points from our submission, if you look at it, we've been really, really consistent throughout this whole process as a council of really focused on, you know, what is are the impact going to be on our community and protecting community well-being, particularly around matters of affordability of water services, um, um, and also around when the decisions are made at arm's length, what the impact is that of that is of, is on communities. So um, the other one is a um, point that we've been making quite um, strongly is around the impact of council being able to continue to deliver its BAU services throughout the transition and after um, the transition with what our residual functions would be, like our roads and our parks and stuff. So it's just a quick recap to, to go into the, um, this, the governance structures part of this is, and I, and I have shown you this slide at the last meeting, um, we can't see anything in there that is different from what I presented there, that would be a fish hook or a, an issue. Um, the the co-governance is retained um, and all the territorial authorities are represented on the um, regional representative group. That is the body that provides a strategic direction for the water services entities boards. It cannot interfere in operations, but it does provide a strategic um, direction through a statement of performance expectations. So, um, we would recommend supporting these amendments to the um, to the structures because they give via council they give um, communities another mechanism through councils to have a voice in these um, decisions at a strategic level. This one here is, um, oh, I wanted to also should have mentioned in that um, previous slide as well in the governance structures, 10 water service entities. There are issues which I wanted to talk about through this slide around that um, model, that shift. 
Um, so the minister has the power um, under this bill would have the powers to do a number of things such as um, improve the provision of water service to require a water service entity to improve how they go about their business. Um, to ensure business continuity, all of these sorts of things, but um, I'm not sure why they would need these powers because there is going to be a government policy statement on this on these things eventually anyway. But there is one thing in that list that the minister can direct that I think is quite critical and I wanted to draw your attention to is around the minister can, can compel water service entities to enter into shared services. So, um, so that's one of a mechanism that we can um, we could see that could help us just to retain some of the loss of the economies of scale with a move from four to ten water services entities, um, because you know there's ten offices, there's ten office locations to support through this now, not four. There are ten sets of staff, and you know you guys are business people as well and understand the implications of that. Um, there are some operational level tasks that are not going to be different across water services entities um, because they're well recognized practices about how to do things like manage your debt. Um, and there are some real efficiencies to be gained from um, some of the functions being led and delivered at a national scale. So we, so I would ask that you consider asking the government to load as much into that ministerial direction as possible to reduce the, um, um, to make sure that we see these massive affordability gains. I wanted to point you to this um, slide. It's on page six of twelve in the in the report. Um, and as you'll see under there, you know, scenario one is what they're projecting that councils would have been. Um, Households will be paying by 2054 um, for water services. We we contest that um, for a lot of reasons, and um, yeah. But the two critical things really are scenario two, which was the old model of four water service entities, versus scenario three, the ten. There is a big difference there for communities in terms of affordability, from 1,260 to 4,010, and so. Um, Shared services is a mechanism to be able to actually say, let's claw some of that back. Um, how it actually looks in practice is that um, you'd see a, a number of water service entities come together and through those subsidiary provisions that we talked about way back in January when the last peak bill came out, the water legislations bill came out, and we made a lot of points about the, those subsidiaries. So I would also recommend that we um, bolster those points that we made initially about subsidiaries just to, to shore up what happens with the assets for instance if a um, if a subsidiary folds yeah. um, do they come back to the water service entity or are they sold off all of that kind of stuff you know and and to, to really press home that the dividends from this some from these subsidiaries actually come back to the water service entities and the communities every day you're happy to take questions as you go yeah, might be the best idea actually, because mm -hmm. then you can and specific stuff. So Councillor Telfer can... just had a question, and I think it is it's best if we just um, maybe do questions as you go. Yep. If it's something that's still going to come up, we you can just say I am going to cover it. But yep. otherwise, yeah, okay, Councillor cool. Telfer, thank you. Yeah, Beth, um, I just have one question around um, this whole um, scenario has sort of been sold on the pre pre like, like when you look at scenario two there. Um, of the four entities, mm. $1,260. Mm. Uh, have you seen the detail around how that was worked out or how they've come up with that? Because um, we're talking that is 30 years away. Mm. And $1,260 in 30 years' time, <coughs> um, I'd, I'd struggle to see what that's even going to deliver, let alone. Um, so seeing the detail, because it's very, very easy to come up with a number of 1260 and people look at that and go, compare it to $16,700 and go, oh, well, this must be better. Well, I, look, I actually really, really struggle to, to actually understand how you come up with a number yep. um, for 30 years' time with what we've seen with, happen with inflation and, and our whole cost structure over the last five years, mm -hmm. let alone 30 years' time. So mm -hmm. um, 
you know, people forget in a 30 years time, no one will even come up and say, oh, well, this is what they told us, it's going to be compared to that. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, have, have, has that detail around how that um, number has come up, has that been shared? Yeah, they have shared the initial costings. So this, the initial costings for this were done but years, ages ago by Wix, the Scottish crew, who came out and did that initial um, assessment. Um, there's been a lot of debate around this, um, and we had our own um, report done by Castalia um, in 2022, um, which was kind of overshadowed by the fact by the released at exactly the same time when the government turned around and said, "No, we are mandating this now. We, it is no longer, um, it is no longer a voluntary arrangement." Um, and maybe Pauline would like Pauline's really across the Castalia stuff, and so she's really aware of the assumptions um, that were in that report that we would want to test. Um, did you want to say anything, Pauline? Uh, not much, that, but but just to raise the same concerns. Um, their projections weren't comparing apples with apples and some of the things that were excluded. Um, as to the second um, entity um, that they're now saying, we, we don't have any idea or any visibility of how they arrived at that. Um, and it was done at pace. So it is uh, an unknown and um, so fraught with um, assumptions that they may have made, but we can have no visibility with it. But you're quite right. I think the really critical thing to note is that while they may have done the assumptions on the very, very, very streamlined version of for scenario two, what has happened since then is there's been a number of, of, of um, amendments that I think that they will be surprised at the cost of, which councils are very, um, are very aware of the costs of democracy and the costs of engaging with communities and having a properly representative things. And I don't think those things have been those costs have been pulled in to this model. So I think they are going to get a shock when they uh, yeah, roll through that. Um, what's the next one? Gone fine. Okay. Is there uh, so that I'll interrupt you when I see hands go up. Oh, thank you. Me. Yeah, great. Thank you. So the water, there is um, an, another sort of a, almost a, a necessary, I don't want to say evil, but a necessary thing to, that has come along as this the establishment of a water services funding agency would have a similar role to the local government funding agency, would be set up not as a company as such. Well, I'm, I'm not sure how it would actually be set up, but um, it's a way that they can um, get access to um, funding and debt um, through uh, for water services entities by check, by scale, basically. Um, and it would be one of the first of these shared services things, um, vehicles to be established. Um, the good things um, that have come through the bill is the government has finally recognised it can't just take its hands right off this um, and say you're on your own now because water is such a critical service for communities so there is some provisions in the bill that um, talk about um, government may lend money to a fund to the funding agency to shore it up and um, where it's in the interests best interests of um, of um, New Zealanders and it can also guarantee the debts of the funding agency so they are uh, that is the way they have gotten around um, the ability to be able to generate more capital is by setting up this funding agency, basically. <clears throat> we are going to go through the, the, the provisions in more detail to, um, around that, but we, we would recommend really supporting that um, as a... Um, well, the services funding agency, the whole, the whole thing is based on the fact that you know, they've got capital in the ground, which you, um, you know, identify the worth of, so you can borrow. It's economies of scale. They're going to get all this infrastructure. It's already been um, hugely debted by the councils, and then they're going to have that in a mail made all together so they can create a bigger debt. So 
you know, you would think in a, in a normal situation like that with any business, it would be like a destiny, a destiny for doom. <laughs> so, you know, how can we be confident that this is not going to be the same? I mean, you know, we've got so much debt in our country at the moment, in our councils, and we're going to create more debt, which we're going to put onto our customers, who um, you know, at the end of the day are going to you know, be the payers. So, you know, there's no, everything is just, you know, warning signs, <laughs> warning signs are just, you know, everywhere on this, aren't they? I just, you know, you cannot fund any business from, from you know, debt, from just amalgamating all your assets together to, so you've got a bigger pool to create more debt. You know, it's just ridiculous. I think the thing with this one is that it allows the debt to be spread over a longer period of time. So the the costs for um, communities are, are, are brought down slightly. So I think that was there. Um, there are some rules, my understanding is in terms of how we are funded, we have some constraints around some of that stuff. So um, this is a way that they are trying to look at that. Look, I, I'm not defending it in any way, um, Councillor Foster, it's just that. Um, because the biggest problem is that everyone is underfunded. Every bit yeah. of infrastructure right throughout the country is underfunded. Yeah. So <laughs> by creating more debt and spreading it over a long period of time um, doesn't make sense to me, I'm afraid. <laughs> anyway. Uh, on page 195, it says Mana engaging directly with DIA on policy and aspects yep. um do we know how their engagement's going because i'd suggest that's not going to be a two-minute job and if there's capability there for that to happen and, and who's representing that it's we have been told by the ntu that they are engaging with with mana whenua they have a separately established entity if Iwi, um, mana whenua iwi reference group that they are working with um yeah so so we don't know too much in, in regards to how that engagement tracking so i remember right in the beginning when dia came to us it was direct engagement with us and we, and they had direct engagement with iwi mm. and that is the process they have followed mm. um right up to now it's, it's, it's important because you see the, the national transition you, in, the, in the DIA structure there's the, the CE and then there are a number of, of second layer reports one of them is the national transition unit which is specifically deep looking at how we move all of these um, 67 councils stuff into the new water service entities and then alongside that is the policy team which is driving these bits of legislation and then there is a um, uh, an iwi engagement team and it, it's critical to note that those things are on a at the they they are different teams and they are um at the same level so this um the whole matter of iwi engagement is really important to them um so they um they won't they will be going at the pace that iwi can go at was there a question on this side no nope. you can move on so the next um, important thing is um, mergers. Um, it's not necessarily important right now, but it may become important into the future. So that the bill now allows for um, two or more water service entities to merge together, basically. It may be in the future if entity F can't get the scale that is needed to make this water services affordable for communities that they may want to um, consider merging with another. It's a voluntary process. Um, basically, um, a, a, a council, one of the one of the TA owners, a mana whenua representative, um, a, a board or a consumer forum, um, um, or a crown rep, and the crown, there's, a, there's um, a number of different crown representatives involved in this process can ask for a merger um they read and they ask the regional representative group which is that co-governance body of council reps and mana whenua reps and that um rrg body must look at it um and engage with in really general terms interested persons in the water services area <laughs> which yeah um, and then they make a decision about whether they're going to go um, forward with um, getting a full proposal 
worked up for this. Um, when they get to the point of a, um, when they get to that point, they have to have a 75% majority of the RRG to agree to go into a merger situation. But if the Crown is the driver of the merger proposal, you only have to have a 50%. It's not even a majority, I'm sorry. I can't see how 50% is a majority. <laughs> so um, in practice, what this means is that the council or mana whenua, as I find it really divisive actually, could vote on a merge that has been requested by the Crown without a clear majority or a cluster of geographical interests coalesced around a particular interest could vote in a merger without a clear majority. But um, all of the RRGs um, must decide to implement the um, proposal. So you'll see there's, you know, when you're merging, there's more than one RRG involved. So you'll see in here, um, you must have a, for a crown initiated proposal, all of 50% of the RRG for entity E, F and G must agree to a proposal. And then it goes to the next stage, which involves consultation um, and an implementation plan that is done through ordering council. There are, it's important to note that there are some protections for some things in this, so treaty obligations. Um, to mana o te wai statements um, and any agreements with mana whenua are carried through in a merger. They, they are not. Um, so um, there's two things that I worry me about this is around the 50% majority and how divisive that could be um, within an RRG and within a, a region. And I also have questions about the relate, how the relationship agreements and the service level agreements that are going to be required between councils and the water services entity to make things run. And these, think, these agreements are, are around how we will jointly manage stormwater and how we will also integrate our land use planning with, our, with their infrastructure planning so that, things, so that the system can work. And those relationship and service level agreements are the things that, um, that, that tell that story. My question is, what will happen to those in a merger? Councillor Robinson. Why, why are only um, entities E, F and G in that table? It's, sorry, it's an example. Okay. Yeah, don't take me. <laughs> I thought we might have a different literally rules it's, for us. It's, it's conceptual. It's a conceptual model because we just don't know. Yeah, I think I did this last time and I think you got wound up about that too. <laughs> is, is there any sort of talk around the water corridor as to how this might actually look and whether it would even be, you know, taken up by someone at some stage? Is it after it's all shaken down and people go, okay, we think we should probably merge with our neighbours because we've got, you know, scale. Or, yeah, no, there's no, what. there's we'll, no. We'll take over their resources stealthily. There's no appetite at the moment with, um, these are going to be enough trouble getting into one the current water service entities for many councils. So that yeah. is a future future thing to consider. Um, bearing in mind that a, um, a board will be running the water service entity and they can make a merger request. So they'll be looking at the financials and at the um, ability to deliver. And um, they will they may decide to go down um, and put a re request in into the future, or the crown may. Um, and do the sorry do the entities have to be neighbours or could it be like no we could poach Nelson no and and um, not Auckland, at all Auckland could you serve yeah us. exactly I mean you could yep. look at an uh, an entity that's actually quite quite a healthy balance sheet yep. and say we want to merge with them exactly because of, of what their yep. asset base is absolutely okay interesting if it, I assume past part of our submission will be our concern with the rushed. Um, yep. Uh, process and the short time frames for something that is a massive piece of work that will <clears throat> impact us um, significantly and I do want that to be clear in our submission concern raised with the rushed nature of this. Thank you. Absolutely. Community priority statements which we talked about at the last three as well. Um, I put a table into the report on page seven um, to try and distinguish what we can tell of the difference between the community priority statements and the te mana o te wai statements. Um, they're basically a mechanism for local voice, really local voice, as in like 
interest coalesced around a water body that um, for, um, you know, and, and what those interests are. In terms of the environment, um, they do have a few hurdles to jump through, as the report says, they have to go through in a, a regional representative group um, that then is directed to a consumer forum. So, and then it comes um, back up to the board through reports and, and the like. So, um, as you'll see from this, the Te Mano Te Wai statements, they have to be given effect to. They have to have a plan around how they will respond to this. There are some pub, they have, are publicly available. You know, they, there's, there's some really strong wording in here that it will be difficult to wiggle out of. Um, <clears throat> my, I recommend that we put a submission point in there that because I have also heard um, debate within the wider um, community around that these community priority statements should be strengthened. Um, I, I recommend that we um, consider whether, whether we want to um, put something into it that says that these community priority statements should not be allowed to undermine or overwrite what is in a te mana or te wai statement or what is in a RRGs um, statement of performance, strategic performance expectation. Um, so these two documents that are, those are the, 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 the regionally local voice mechanisms that a community priority statement should not be able to come in and overwrite, over, over top those things. Um, because these community priority statements are potentially, an individual can write, you know, can, can put one of these in. And there is the real potential for um, self-interested um, motivations for them is, you know. Clarify that the second part, you said to Manu Tawai and then the RRG part. Can you just clarify the RRG part of the, of the two areas you were concerned about? You said yeah, that sure. the, the community policy statements shouldn't override or shouldn't override the Timana or Tawai statements. And the second part you said was the RRG. Yep, I'll go um, back to this picture here. So this is, so the regional representative group, essentially they have, they okay, set sorry. the strategic direction for, for the, um, for the board mm -hmm. and they prepare a state through that through a statement of performance, strategic performance expectations, which is, sets out what the board, the direction of the board. Um, and they can, um, yeah, so that is what I'm talking about. And, and this, the RRG is the co-governed body of community interests, basically. But what if that statement or policy that came out with it was quite poor and was obviously overridden by, you know, if it was just a really poor statement or wasn't particularly visionary or didn't actually encompass or capture what it should have, um, it may well be overridden by the community policy statement for the better. But what you're saying is that should be held, you know, I think these um, water service entities are going to be highly professional, is what I would say. Um, it's not going to be a bunch of people sitting around going, what should we do? You know, these are going to be um, the mayors and, and, the, and the mayors and CEs and, um, and, and highly regarded mana whenua people. And they will, yeah, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't imagine that they're going to be produce something dumb. Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, Councillor Pahu. Because we've never produced anything. <laughs> Councillor <laughs> Pahu, and then Councillor Thompson. <laughs> uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I absolutely agree with what you just said about strengthening the um, statement around Te Mano Te Wai. Uh, I mean, looking at all of this, there's a lot of noise around the way, around everything. But um, in regards to Te Mano Te Wai, at community and hapu level, um, those in mana whenua, my understanding, under te mana o te wai, strengthen, is strengthened at the community and hapu, or at the hapu level, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I absolutely agree that, that it shouldn't be overridden, those statements by mm -hmm. us. The, the whole process, the whole, you know, trying to understand and comprehend all of this, and then taking that back down to community and hapu level um, to make sure that those who live with the waters 
in her responsibility, kaitiakitanga over those, um, is not muddied by all of the distraction and all of the noise that's going around up here when actually it's on the ground mm -hmm. and the ability to look after, care for, mm -hmm. and hold and trust all of those responsibilities by mm -hmm. um has to come first. Mm -hmm. So I absolutely agree with your statement. I don't envy you putting this together in such a short time, mm -hmm. um, but thank grateful for your expertise mm -hmm. in the space and your concern mm -hmm. um, over everything. So, Kilda. Thank you, Councillor Papuruhuri. Why Councillor Thompson? Um, th there's a lot of noise in terms of the, how, how this is getting rushed and rushed through. through. Um, have they given a reason why there why there is such a rush? Why they're trying to push it? <laughs> No one has explicitly stated, um, other than to say the cyclone recovery has made pushed this um, uh, made this um, more urgent. Um, which I'm not sure that we completely agree with needing to go faster because we are in recovery mode. <laughs> so um, yeah, we we all know it's because there isn't a general election coming up, and they um, yeah. I think they're actually looking out to the election after this, to be honest, that they're wanting to see everything bedded down by 1 July 2026 so that they, there is a, if, if there is a, a Labour government return to this time, they can turn around after 1 July 2026 and say, look at all the good work that's happened as a result of this and how well it's gone. Um, yeah, or at least some distance between that and the, the 2027 election. Mm. Um, so the good segue in terms of um, to the critical issue that we really wanted you to understand today is, uh, is around the bits and pieces that have come through um, around the timing of the transition. Um, so 1 July 2026 is the deadline under the bill for completion of all water service entities transitions. With 10 entities, they do not have the capacity to do it all simultaneously, so they're going to stagger it. Um, and we have, um, and the minister will be made the decision around the staggering of which water services entities go at, um, at what time. So the in National Transition Unit um, is doing an assessment of entity readiness. Um, they are focused basically in their criteria around the risks and the costs to the NTU and the government. Um, <coughs> which is sort of, sort of fair enough. However, there is significant risks and costs to the councils as well. So um, there is one criteria out of the nine that is focused on what um, councils and mana whenua think about in terms of timing. And I would say, actually, I think that if the, all of the groups within an entity can come to, so all the mana whenua within an entity and all of the councils within an entity can all agree that that would be a very strong case to put to the minister. Um, in fact, Without that agreement, the minister will make the decision um, regardless of what's going to happen. So what I will say, it is that really, really critical to understand mana whenua position on the timing and the timing and readiness for them um, and what they can achieve given the um, recovery. We did have um, some discussion um, and the, um, what was her name, Maria? Maria from the, um, yeah, from the um, Māori engagement team at DIA has sort of indicated that um, a lot of the um, entity F mana whenua are so wrapped up with the recovery right now that um, the capacity has been limited to engage. So they are meeting next week, I understand. So that's making some progress. Um, Wanted to just go through some of the, so I've put up there a, a couple of options. Uh, option number one, obviously the, the Auckland councils will be going live in July, 2024. Um, and so the, the first cab off the rank, so to speak, would be October, 2024, um, which is only really 13, 14 months away. Um, option two would be possibly um, a, a mid-term option of 2025 and then a, and then a late term option so 
you know, just so that you can see the spread of these um, things. I just wanted to talk through the issues that, that um, we've been um, working through to try and identify when it would be a, the best or a good time for us to transition. There's clearly an issue. The biggest one is the recovery efforts and how much time is and capacity we don't have within the staff. So it's really important. I really want you guys to understand how much effort it, it is taking of our staff and our people to, to resource the transition. What the NTU just in the background of this is preparing is a, a runway for anyone count, um, that is going to, to transition. And they are looking at it's a 15 month runway. So if you go, are going live in October 2024, your runway starts on one July, one July in three, two days time. Um, so that means at, at that point, you need to establish a board and start looking at your RRG and start doing this. And so, so um, and, and have all your partners on board, you know, the, yep. for us, the yep. whole of the Hawke's Bay, yep. Wairua and us. So the, so the recovery effort is big. The um, election is coming up in October 2023, at which point we don't know, even with a change in, even with a change in, even if the current government uh, major party stays in power, there may be other coalition partners, you know, and things may still change. Um, and, and, and the opposition has declared that they would repeal what is um, if they were to, to take the seat. So there's a massive uncertainty around that that we will not know about until, uh, which means the runway is, is becomes truncated um, even more. Um, the um, staff capacity is a, is a really big thing. We really wanna look after our people who are already under pressure and their capacity um, because the transition, it's really important to note that for instance, Pauline's team is heavily involved in large aspects. It's not just the Three Waters team that are involved in this. There is the compliance and monitoring people. There is um, the finance team, the legal team. Um, our, our HR team is getting you know, heavily involved. So this affects across the entire council. Um, there is, um, in saying that, what we, we sort of, um, we have had some a major, um, uh, announcements in terms of people leaving within our Three Waters team to pursue other things with um, as well. So we are really aware of the potential staff attrition. So we also do not want to see things pushed out too long. Um, um, and also there's some, uh, the longer it's pushed out, the, the more uncertain it is for our people, um, our staff. Um, there are some issues around the largely untested transition process going early would see us become almost test cases for um, mistakes and rework and all of that sort of stuff. Um, can I just finish the, the thing just in case? The um, annual plan cycles as well is important to understand. We don't try not to wait, make more, more work for Pauline um, in terms of <laughs> going mid-cycle, um, whereas a nice clean July date is, a, a July date is clean because it means that we're not flowing things through into the next, um, and into the next um, financial year and annual plan cycle. There are some statutory requirements that are coming down the pipe at us in terms of Taumata Otawai is um, going to start to move away um, extend its um, reach into talking about wastewater and stormwater and regulating those things. So they will be requiring us to contribute to um, provide compliance data and a whole range of things that will be um, have some resource implications. Um, we're better off that a water services entity is, is, is engaged in that rather than the council. The Commerce Commission as well is going to start, to, as it slowly will increase over time. So. What I'm trying to say is we don't want to leave it to the last minute because there's going to be a whole bunch of statutory requirements falling on us to deliver on. Um, yeah, but the other the, uh, the balancing for this is the debt levels and funding availability as well. So um, we don't want to have um, we want to free up our access to capital and debt um, uh, as quickly as possible. Yeah. So yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so at the start, I got the feeling that you thought that to go early would be a bit difficult for us because we're in recovery. 
And by the end of it, I felt like you were saying that we should go early so we don't get caught up. And I just wonder if you can clarify what you think we should do. And also, what does Hawke's Bay think um, we should do? And I, it just all feels so yep. hopeless. So these, um, we have had some discussions with Hawke's Bay. What did you want to talk about? I just put a lolly in my mouth. Yeah. So I want to ask Nadine to speak about our <laughs> Yeah, so we um, had an initial meeting with the chief executives of Hawke's Bay. They're in a similar situation where they're losing um, key staff members as well. So the sooner we could move, the better, because then that takes care of, um, you know, any other potential risk around further attrition of um, staff. Uh, they also saw it as an opportunity to align it with the recovery efforts, so the build back better kind of approach, so you get more resilience funding if you move sooner to stand up the um, entity. Mm. Um, then we met with the mayors and the CEs and that's a mix, that was a mixed um, bag really in terms of um, actually let's just wait until the elections. Our community wasn't consulted on um, this entity. We engaged around Entity C, which was the bigger one. So therefore not really convinced I want to move on it. So it, it's really quite mixed, I think, just kind of reflecting um, Mm. on where we're at and yes I do see that there's opportunities in the recovery space and yes I'd like to move faster um, if we could from a risk management perspective but there are these just these key unknowns around the election which I think we really need to be honest about um, yeah so that was my take on things thank you your worship am, am I right in um, thinking that uh, Councillor Tibble is a way um, because she's chairing an inaugural meeting of Mana Otawai. And, and if that's the case, how organized is this group to um, be, be part of this at this point in time? You can ask her when she's back. I cannot speak on her behalf or um, the Te Mana Otawai work that is happening. I just know that government and DIA have been directly working with Iwi. Do you have a, no. So we'll ask her when she's back. Thank you. I'd just like, really like some sort of discussion around, um, yeah. Uh, having been across how much time it's taking I mean, like, it's it's really, really this is really, really difficult. Um, a really, really difficult decision, which is why I suppose Nadine is <laughs> wanting to to seek your um, advice on 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 what um, what your thoughts are on this. I think critically, if we do reach out to Mana Whenua and they say we want to go at this time, that might tip us over the um, line to be. You know, where we land, where the minister will not progress um, or not listen to council on its own in terms of a date. This is a partnership. It's a definite partnership. And what I wanted to say also about Auckland going first, nothing changed for Auckland no. and Northland when they changed from the no. four entities to 10. So the work that they have been doing for the last two years are just carrying on. Nothing changed when they moved to four to four enti uh, ten entities. That that grouping still stayed the same. So they are in a vastly different position than anyone else. So um, I just wanted to to note that as well. Councillor Farehanger, Councillor Foster, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to clear up a, a comment uh, made in regards to Councillor Tibble. I don't think she's chairing anything. Um, she had shared with us that she was. Him seeing a conference around Te Mano o Te Wai. And just also to clarify, Te Mano o Te Wai is in a group of people. Mm. It's a concept around uh, fresh water paint. It's a Tao Māori uh, concept of principles around fresh water paint. So just to, yeah. just to clarify that for the public record, because oh, of things that we've seen here. Up here. Thank you. Councillor Foster, thank you. It's, it's just and then Councillor Robinson. It was just a comment earlier about um, <laughs> the Hawke's Bay meals and CEs, and uh, of, you know, from what I gather, you're, you're saying that they, they, um, 
they just think that there's going to be a, um, the election is going to be changed and then so they're not worrying about having to progress anything at the moment or even discuss the possibilities of us being involved so is that not what I'm no no that's 100 percent not no i think we also need to just step back and before three waters as we knew it the old one was introduced our neighbours in the Hawke's Bay came together and they had a clear model of what they wanted to counter propose to the government. So a lot of work happened there. Nadine and I had discussions with them way back saying, if the government choose that, that was before the entities were announced, we would be keen to talk to you because we can see us doing that. Since then, the four entities were announced. So that work that they did was abandoned or well, not abandoned, but they now they had to focus now they on the on the force. Now we are back in a position where but but what is being proposed now is totally different from the original Hawks Bay mm. model. And I'll talk to councillors a little bit later. There might be a Zoom on Monday where all of us councillors and Hawke's Bay councillors can get a basic update because I just want to let you know we're on the same information level as our Hawke's Bay mayors so no Larry they are actively wanting to, to talk to us what they did raise is in the next four months there's a lot of uncertainty there's rushed legislation yeah. there are lots of issues that are not clear so we should be responsible and um, make sure we're aware of the risks mm. that are possibly coming our way and some of those risks Yvette wants to make want to make clear is in our submission which will then go to to the hearing so no they are keen for discussions saying that there are five mayors you only have to deal with me there are five there. So you can just understand what I'm trying to say is there are different opinions, different balance sheets, different community voices, and we should respect that. So um, it is complex. Is that a fair summary, Nadine? I saw another hand, Councillor Robinson. So Nadine, you said that because of the staff stresses, the resourcing issues, you'd like a steer probably sooner rather than later. And um, Yvette, you had the middle box option two highlighted. Um, is it fair to say that we should, you know, all things equal, we should probably aim for an option two? Um, and for me, the, oh, the critical point not. there is understanding my mm -hmm. position on timing readiness. Um, there's no point us saying we're going to pick option two without our partners having said we're in for option two. Sorry. <laughs> option the box isn't highlighted it's a table but <laughs> with the shading so it's, yeah. it's yeah it's, it's a <laughs> but, but it's, isn't that the reality that we're not going to be in a position to be option one we should proceed as if the legislation isn't going to be repealed because that's that's the runway that's in front of us um we, we should not i don't believe act as as if we're just going to wait to see what happens in four months time because it's just going to load a lot of stress on our staff yeah, I agree. And, and we're, we're just um, derogating our responsibilities, I think, if we do that. So my view is, from what you've said, um, we should be having conversations where we're probably aiming for option two, because it lines, aligns nicely with our recovery um, timeframes. We probably, and funding, and um, building back better. Um, and really, it's a case of us understanding what our partners want to do, and are they going to be ready in this time frame? And then probably advocating that to the government. That's where we, we think we should be. That's my position. Thank you for that, Councillor Robinson. Councillor Tupara, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for the presentation. Uh, rather a comment than a question. Um, I certainly acknowledge the complexities of, of this matter and, and the anxieties around um, trying to make decisions when we have an election looming in October. And my comment is just around um, the difficulties we're facing here in Council and, and all the territorial policies will be um, it's just to note the difficulty uh, must be even more so for mana whenua, Māori and iwi as they struggle through this as well. And um, I, I think it is important that we do continue to establish those links and have those discussions with them um, while we are attending to 
our, our neighbouring local authorities um, that also attending to the partnership, I think is a, a, a something to might actually give us a capacity going forward. And, and it's already been stated that the, the waiting for just council going, um, proposing options is better reinforced if mana Fino is there. Um, but I'm extremely conscious that they must be struggling immensely um, with what we're struggling with. And um, just a little, ensure that that's noted in our, in our going forward. Councillor Telfer, thank you. Yeah, look, I, I appreciate that um, what you said about um, staff attrition and, and people wanting to know, but I think we've got to be careful we don't start promising something that we haven't got the power to deliver by saying we, we want to go then, because this is not a decision solely for us, it's a decision um, for everybody that's involved in, in, in um, our area. So I think the first thing the real priority needs to be is getting those entities together and making a decision jointly so we can come back because otherwise we're going to start promising stuff and we're going to give you staff false expectations that we're saying well, we're going to go in July 2025 when we have not gotten literally no control over that so I think that is that should be our our directive from this table is to let's progress that as fast as we can at those discussions mm -hmm. and until that entity can come up with a, that decision we have not got the ability to progress and 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 to be fair the discussion we've had in regards to three waters have been a two-year journey which then suddenly changed two months ago with all two years worth of work is now a total different focus um total different if i think of how many evenings i have spent on zooms with mayors and ceos from entity c and working how we are going to do stuff going forward and now that is gone. Now we're starting the journey with mayors and entity F, which is us in the walk space. So I also just want to take this opportunity and say, this has been a two year journey where a lot of work from staff has gone into something which is now obsolete. I'm sure a lot of it can carry over and can. I'm not saying it's all, um, but it, it's a total different change. Like we have only had our first and we were going to go down, but obviously in the civil defense emergency, we couldn't go down to the hawk space, so we zoomed in. But that's the first of many to come. And I will keep you updated if that Zoom is going to happen on Monday, what, what they be, be talking about, but I'll let you know in that regard. Any other questions or queries in regards? We will leave it in your capable hands to give us the summary of what will be in our submission and then we take it from there. Thank you, Yvette. Oh, no, let's ask this. Mm. Thanks, Yvette. So um, I'm going to put in, I'll, I'll just go through what I think. I think say yay to make. We support these things. Support the TAs being at Your microphone, Yvette. Um, we will uh, I'll, we will support all TAs being represented on the RRG. We'll support the continued co-governance and support the 10 entities with the proviso that shared services is um, a, a core part of this and that there is ministerial direction on as much as possible um, where, those, um, where those services are not unlikely to vary across the country and where there is massive efficiencies um, and cost reductions possible through them. Um, I did want to say, uh, put some examples down there, which I'm sorry I forgot to go through. There's things like billing customers and debt collection, <coughs> customer, com customer complaints and requests for service that can be handled. They have got a really, really, I've seen um, a little look at their proposed new uh, customer management system and it's really cool like it's, it's quite an amazing dashboard where they can highlight where issues pop up on a screen like we have for civil defense mm -hmm. where the dashboard can hop up and that and it's all linked into the, the, the um, contractors um, instant queries to contractors to get, get out and fix things sorry anyway so um, um, that we would support our water services funding agency because it allows funding at scale and um, the government security um, and additional funding from government. 
um, that we questioned, well, and then the previous point that we questioned why they would need to have some of these um, central government directions because they'll be in a GPS. Um, the merge, in terms of mergers, um, we'll question why the, what happens to the relationship agreements and service level agreements for councils. Um, we support the transfer of the obligations. Um, what do, would you like to say about the, do you want to say anything around, there are some mechanisms around 50% of members of every every RRG has to have to agree to a proposal. So yeah, which is even 51. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Um, we will do what we said here, which is to make sure that the community priority statements cannot overlap or over to overwrite a, a Terminal Te Wai or a RRG's statement. Um, and we will say, um, basically, I think what we'll say here is, is potentially that, um, that they make sure that they work with the councils in mana whenua on this, that it's really critical that the minister listens. More info before we can commit to time, is that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so the thing for us, some, a couple of, so I'm, I'm really sorry, the report that I wrote was really, really, really hurried. Um, and so I didn't do the proper um, recommendations properly. So mm -hmm. I just basically said that you'll prepare a submission. I didn't say that to submit, submit it. And I didn't, we didn't know that it was, it was not going to be the Finance and Expenditure Committee. It's the Governance and, and Administ Administration Select Committee. So I just wanted to clarify that recommendation. Yep. So mm -hmm. it's clear for mm -hmm. um, the records, but also that the council note that CE will continue to lead the transition work basically and to update the councillors regularly on, on what's happening. Um, if we can just also make, sure you add our concern with the rush process yeah. oh yeah, sorry of, I, I want that to oh, there's a few other things here. Oh, oh, sorry. yeah so sorry and um, the costs we will question the costs um and how they arrived at those costs for um we will talk about the rush pr uh, process how big an impact it has and the, the changes sudden in the short time frame um we will talk about the muddy muddy waters and what it will be like for communities to try and understand this on the ground and at a hapu level um and yeah, we will talk about how our mana whenua need um, and us need time to come together to discuss um, what's best for our region. Didn't um, Councillor Tupara's, and please correct me if I'm wrong on this one, um, Councillor Tupara, I understood your point to be that the, um, the disproportionate impact on mana whenua resourcing in our current climate, climate environment uh, should be noted. I, I thought that's what um, Councillor Tupata was said. I think it was captured. Yep. I think it was captured in the last point there, and I think that's a discussion to be had when that engagement occurs on where those um, differences and, and um, um, reverse all of differences can, can occur yeah. will be in that engagement. Okay, Councillor, so on page 187, we have a recommendation. Thank you, Evit. We have a recommendation. Uh, endorse the key points. So Evit has just highlighted the key points. Can we just get those recommendations back on screen, please? There we go. And then for additional recommendations, what Evit has just highlighted for us, that um, our CEO will make, as always, a uh, uh, to the select committee on our behalf, and that Nadine will continue to lead our council transition work and update councillors on this. Um, so do I have a mover for this? Moved by Councillor Robinson, seconded by Councillor Gregory. All in favour, contrary, carried. Thank you, councillors. I think we're going to grab a quick coffee and then we will be back 22, please. It's 15 minutes and then we'll, um, we, we have still a lot to do before we get to lunch. So grab a coffee and go. Okay, councillors, I quickly want to take you back and just move that we accept our late items, which was sent through last night, but alerted to by um, Mrs. Conn early in the week. I move that we accept that, seconded by Councillor Gregory. All in favour, contrary, thank you. Councillor Elder voted against, thank you. Notice of motion, we've got no adjourned business. 
Okay, we're going to move to page nine, councillors. Nine. So we have seen this and the work in our annual plan several times before. It's been a work in progress, Nadine. Thank you to all your teams doing one massive piece of work where our clear focus is recovery. And even since we've discussed that, we have again moved into a response mode and again, again moved into recovery. So I just want to um, open the floor for you and Pauline to have a quick chat, and then we'll take it from the uh, any councillors that might have questions. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Worship. Um, yes, you, you have basically um, summed up this annual plan. Um, it is a step of two halves, if you like, uh, where we had the draft and we had uh, there, there was a little different from what we committed to do within our long-term plan. Um, but then since Gabrielle, there is a program of work that was different than what we expected to do. And that's the part where uh, we uh, went um, seeking um, sort of considerations from uh, the community on, on what else could we be doing um, in that particular time. Um, the, the consultation that was, as I said, it was what was different, um, what we had already consulted on with the LTP um, wasn't um, brought up again, but it was trying to um, mention those point of differences. Um, again, this annual plan is a short focus, it is a 12-month focus, um, as we um, need to do what we need to do um, while planning for when we need to be. Um, uh, some of the, uh, the submissions that we have, um, we, we also know that they will feed into our next part, which is our three-year recovery. Um, <coughs> and some of those things we can't necessarily do at the moment because we need to change policies. And that's part of the forming stage as we go through there. Uh, but happy to take any questions with regards to this and your plan. Okay, councillors, I'm gonna open the floor if you've got several questions um, or not, that's fine. But just um, maybe slot them all into your one speaking room. We've got a huge amount of work still to get through. Councillor Foster, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's a couple here. Just the first one is on page 11. It's on the recommendations on two. And um, noting that the total of 26.4 million has been included with the region, uh, within the operational costs for cleanup of woody debris and salt. And then B agrees that the expenditure noted on 2B, which I think should be 2A, so that might be needed to be changed of 26.4 million, maybe used towards capital expenditure, expenditure once the best use of that funds has been determined. Um, you know, uh, so that does that mean that the 26.4 million that's been identified for really debris and salt might not be used on that? And if not, what would it be used on? Because, um, you, you know, to me, that's a priority and it's been targeted for that use. And now if it's going to be changed, um, I would like to know what it's going to be changed for. Um, so this that is only can only be used for the treating of the woody debris and um, salt. It can't be used for anything else. But what is just uh, intimating that there may be some things that if there was machinery that was needed to uh, mobilise or do anything like that, that's capital in nature. And the resolution above, it says the capital investment that you improve 17.2. What we're saying that some of the things that we do, all the treatment may be more capital in nature. So it was trying to be agile and to say um, some of the expenditure might be for, say, some land if it needed to be or anything that was to process the woody debris um, would be allowed to be able to be completed. But it, it can only be um, used for that woody debris and um, processing of it. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I've just got one other one to um, page 16. And it's to do with the um, depreciation costs of um, free waters um, valued at, with the revalued assets. So when we have this um, changeover, what happens to that depreciation when, um, when the takeover take um, occurs? You know, the, the money that, the depreciation that we've paid into three waters, um, where does, what happens to that? Does that go over with um, when the transition's done as well? 
Yes. Um, uh, so that's part of the reserves. Anything that we've collected um, on behalf of the three water entities that we actually haven't spent, um, that then has to be paid over to the new entity. Um, so that's that whole uh, final part. We consider what is our position and what, what is it that needs to be there um, and paid back to us. So they, we say, what have we got as loans um, on our books that you need to pay us? But deducting off that is any reserves that we may have collected for the free waters that has to be paid, netted off that. So would there be another valuation before that take, is taken over or those valuations that's been done now will be appropriate? Um, it definitely will be um, as a process. Um, we have that. So this is just the, the valuation. It's what's in the reserves will be de deducted off uh, the loans that need to pay it. So that's our kind of a debt arrangements that we're actually trying to work with DAA and the negotiations, what's the position it will be. But you're quite right, each one of them will be based on what is actually there and, and reviewed right up into the time of transfer. Councillor Thompson and then Councillor Elder, thank you. Yeah, I've, I've sort of a question on sort of similar to Larry's. Um, Page 14, it's showing we're spending 26.4 uh, mil processing and disposal, 6.9 van cleanup. So that's 33.3 uh, mil. Uh, we're getting 31.4 mil government funding. Um, to me, we're not getting that. Forestry's getting that. To, it's not our mess, it's forestry's mess in my eyes. Um, so does that mean we're paying 1.9 mil out of rates for? Forestry cleanup being the shortfall. Sorry, I, I just didn't understand that last part. Um, the shortfall. What? Sorry. Um, so, so, so page fourteen. The total is thirty-three point three million. Um, so, so that's the I'm, third bullet point. I'm yeah. with you now. Sorry. Um, uh, the two different things. Uh, one of them um, is actually damage or, or we see that the woody debris that is close to our waterways, what we want to protect that is maybe on our beaches or any of our own infrastructure, we need, that is a mess that we actually, it needs to be cleared up. And that grant is given for us to be able to remove um, some of those. Um, issues. The second one is our function as a regulatory uh, basis and, and that forestry uh, management team is um, separate to the actual damage of woody debris. Yes, uh, um, yeah, page 14, it's showing yeah, that they were spending 33.3 mil on the cleanup. On page 29, it says government's giving us $31.4 million for cleanup. But so, so there's a short footfall of 1.9 mil in my calculations. Is that shortfall coming from rates? Or? Sorry, I, I'm now with you. So there's two different things here. Um, in total for what's given to council for 31.4 million for the woody debris cleanup, um, is in total. There was an assumption with the annual plan that some of it may have been spent by the 30th of June. So we provisioned what we expected at that time, which is at 31st of May, to what would be the expenditure that going for. So it's just a timing thing. All of 31.4 um, million is, is ours to spend on it. There's nothing that's been transferred to anything um, anywhere else. It was just what did the annual plan provide at that particular time? What were the assumptions that we're making um, that would be completed in next year and what would be completed in this year? The other thing I just want to point out um, that the um, commercial cleanup is a grant that we're administering on, on behalf of the government. It doesn't actually go to us. That is what we would be assessing applications that come through if they have the criteria and they the, then would be passed on to uh, the affected uh, private individuals. Supplementary question? You're, I've got a couple other oh, all good. things, but they're, they're separate. Yep, all separate good. Things. Go for that. Um, uh, just in regards to forestry monitoring and compliance costs, um, I see in our annual plan we've really beefed up um, compliance, and, and I think you know, with what's ha happening, that's totally uh, necessary. Um, the, the issue I've got is when we have the fees and charges 
Um, yeah, well, I mentioned that like, we've got, our housing costs have gone through the roof. Um, and yet, yet we're still, and there's a housing shortage, and, but housing's still paying for their compliance costs. And, and so, is, so is everyone else. Um, the, the one and only submission on fees and charges was saying that other councils charge forestry for the clock compliance costs and we don't and suggesting that forestry should be paying this compliance cost and, and then reading in on page 127 and page 130 uh, federated farmers also mention it in the annual plan submissions so yeah, from the fees and charges says that it was introduced that Forestry pays for the monitoring costs, but it was abandoned. Well, I'm suggesting that they should be paying these costs as, as everyone else's and, and another count, councils they are too. Um, through your worship. Um, so there's a couple of things. It's whether the, the fees and charges is, is, is enough. It's a separate part. The, there is charges that we do charge to forestry, um, but what we will do, the review, um, is, and I believe um, uh, Joe Noble actually said that in the fees and charge discussion that there needs to be a review of what those fees and charges are and are they appropriate going forward. So this is the opportunity that we'll do that. The second part, which was raised out of federated farmers was with regards to are the rates that we collect more appropriate and they're charged um, against the, the different industries of which they mentioned uh, the consents um, in terms of that and how are they paying towards their costs um, associated with it. So that was raised as a rates, and so therefore as part of our revenue and financing policy review and as part of the next stages as we go through, we can definitely be bringing that up. Are they appropriate, the costs that we have and the shares that we have for different um, sectors and for the different activities and um, how they run? So have we got a time frame for this review and likelihood of implementation of these fees? Because it looks like it's sort of dragged on from 2018. So the fees that you've just set go from the 1st of July through to the 30th of June. When you're changing a different regime, you will have to consult um, what that base is at. So in terms of changing your revenue and financing policy, uh, the timeframes that you have um, is that you will decide on what that is, probably about October, but you would be then implementing, you'll have to consult, and then uh, it would begin putting in from the 1st of July, 2024. So basically the next available slot that we can do, we will be um, investigating. Councillor Alder, thank you. Thank you, Your Worship, and apologies for my phone. Um, That's all good. Are we covering covering to a certain page here, or are we doing the whole report in one? We are doing everything at this stage, so okay. you go. Okay, so um, my first question is around the 6.5% increase in rates. Um, as any business, you have to pr produce a budget, which is what we're doing here, but... In the rural community, you produce a budget and you, and you really need to run on it. <clears throat> um, of our 22,200 ratepayers, 8,380 are going over the 6.5 threshold or 38% of our base are paying more than the predicted 6.5%. Mostly rural properties who have already borne the brunt of recent weather events, Increases in wage costs, shortages of labour, and all these have been impacted on their production. Not to mention that they already pay high rates due to the high capital values of their properties. So when, a general, when the general rate goes up 12.36%, which it just did, or was about to, they get hit hard. Um, the way this council moves between high, lifting the rates in the rural Last rate rise, the um, commercial got hit, and then next, the residents get hit. At a time like this, we should be sharing the load, I feel, and to be hitting one sector more than the other 
I don't believe is on. Um, I think we should go back and have a relook at how we're distributing the load. Thank you. Councillor Alder. Thank you, Pauline. Um, so this is, I, I just need to um, explain some of the things as, as context is as you go through. Um, why, why the percentage and what our strategy looks at is what is the increase, the total increase in rates over the previous year. It doesn't mean that that would be distributed easy, um, evenly across all the people uh, within uh, the rateable uh, area. Um, and that is due to maybe some of the services that people have and also their own particular circumstances of the capital value that they have. If they have made improvements, you can expect to pay more of an increase than what was there uh, previously over some people that have no improvements, capital improvements. So just to give you the comparison to say, <clears throat> and how it works, um, and how you can review with your own revenue and financing policy, but effectively, um, you are saying for a rural uh, lifestyle block, and again, if you're looking at it and you're doing the, the things there on page 65, you're paying for what? Those people that are within the city that are, have reticular services, they can expect to pay more. And so you've got a low residential um, property on, on that page, on page 65, which says they have 330,000 and they'll pay in rates about 3,300. A rural lifestyle, which is three times or four times that amount, which is 1.2 million, they're paying um, a difference of about $100. So if you're talking capital value as a proxy um, for the value, it is taken into account. So if you have more services, especially if you're articulated in the services, you would expect to be paying more, and that is reflected in there. So when you see percentages, they don't tell the full story, which is what is the dollar value increase and um, as well. So uh, effectively, there are, two, there, there are two different things that are actually coming into play with all of those percentages. Um, and some of that there is also self-generated increases from capital value. Question. Thank you, Pauline. Supplementary question, which kind of flows on to page, um, page 48, which shows the council's operational expenditure. Um, I, my drainage rate on a rural property is 6% of my rate. Can someone point out to me where on council's operational spending, um, there's a drainage budget for the rural area. Um, I'd also like to add to that, I, I wouldn't get through a single day at the moment, and I guess it's understandable. I don't get through a single day without someone saying, I've got blocked drains, what's the council gonna do about it? Thank you. Pauline. Um, so you're asking, um, so there are different, this is different. There's so many things to unpick in, uh, into those particular cases. You would be looking at the activity of land, rivers, and drainage. You're looking at it a whole, and how does it actually uh, go across those people that are on that scheme? Um, and also, what do you collect rates for on that particular area? So the way that usually works is if you have, say, 100,000, you're doing on the drainage, and there's 10 uh, properties on that, then those people that are connected to it would pay 10,000 each. Very broad break, depends on what the capital value. So you, you, while it might be a high proportion of your rates, it is, there's a lot of things to unpick in those two particular things um, as well. So you would normally see that under the activity um, and uh, the expenditure is not on, we haven't got this particular thing to land, rivers and drainage, but we've got actually what is the maintenance um, per se as part of that, as opposed to just that very generic one which shows where is the different rates um, with that activity. But uh, uh, in terms of your individual budgets, um, that can be provided to you. You can and see that, but I, I'm not sure whether that lands, um, particularly with this overall annual plan uh, over all the budgets, what we actually need to see. That's the kind of the detail that you're actually getting into these particular areas um, with it. Da David, can you answer anything else? No, no other comments, yep. This is not, yeah, this is a more a high level, you know, overall, if there are specific questions, please feel free that someone can maybe look into that for you as well. Just the last bit of your 
your question. Thank you. So, uh, well, I'm have a rest. <laughs> so if you want to have a rest, we can ask other councillors. Okay. I, I, I'm just asking everyone, or just keep going. I'm going to give everyone one go. Okay. Well, go. Yeah. Well, on keep that going. drainage, I think I think it should be specified so that we can actually see where our money's going. It being bulked in with other things is um, is not a good thing. And just a question: I get my rates demand um, old school way in in hard copy. Um, but I've been trying to find um, someone else's rates demand and they get it online, but they only get the front page online. Is the, um, is the, is the second page been given out online or is it just the first page been given on, out online? I would just have to have double check. It should be provided all of the things that maybe the, th but I can certainly um, find that out. Thank you. Because if it isn't, people are missing out on some detail. Um, Great. Can and, we carry? Can we okay. take that offline? But I'll, questions. I'll have a rest then. Thanks. Are you going to have a rest? All good. Um, just anyone that have specific questions about the document in front of us, councillor. You need to change your swap your name because I can barely see today, councillor Cranston. Thank you, and then councillor. Yeah. Thank you. Um, page thirty six. Um, while I fully understand the complexities of our life at the moment and the prioritisation, I do want to talk about water and recycling projects. Um, page 36, we've got the business case for the Tarahiri River walking and site by Sheep Park. And, and over on the other column, we've got a strategy to inform the next steps to improve walking and cycling network. So just wanting to know the status of those two and whether they're working together and what became of the allocation that we did give to this project. Um, so I, I'll give David to answer some of the other things, but just um, some of the walking cycling um, that was in the LTP assumed that there would be, um, had to, needed to have funding from Wakatahi, um, and that is conditional, just like anything else, if we make an assumption that we're going to get external funds, um, the external funds need to be uh, there to so enable us to do that unless there's a, another decision that you wanted to make um, with it. But I can confirm with David with regards to that particular. Yeah, that was the question because we did allocate funding to it. Sorry, Your Worship, we're still waiting for the business case to come back. It'll be coming back to an operations meeting. So the business case is still being done for the Tarihiru Cycling and Walking Way walk away, sorry, as part of the previous council decision to spend the money there. It is linked up with the wider urban strategy around our walking and cycling that Joe and her team are looking into. So those two are linked. It's just a component that we're looking at. Regarding the funding that is still set aside from the better off funding, the funding that was put into the Tarihiru is still there. Um, we haven't undertaken that work at this stage. We're waiting for the business case. It hasn't been specifically allocated at this stage. It's more general. Through your worship, it is allocated to the Tarihiru Walking and Cycleway. We're looking at which options to apply that to, and we'll be making some recommendations on that funding back to council. Right, thank you. And um, page 47, new projects. Um, Wheelie Bins got better off funding. That better off funding gets us to where with Wheelie Bins? Is, we, is that just a expo exploratory, or is it a natural? Through your worship, we're working with the waste contracts and the tenders and procurement for those we'll be coming back to the 1.8 million that was set aside easily purchases the wheelie bins if we were going to apply it to that but we'll be coming back to you for further direction on that thank you councillor tupara thank you page 34 right hand column halfway down second bullet point um, um the suggestion that the new bridge um, is in fact a new a viewing platform. Just put that three. Thank you. We'll note that and we'll make can make that change. Thank you. Any other questions or queries? We've had these in front of us before with some okay. updates. Now, any questions? Councillor Telfer, thank you. Um, yeah, just Page 38, um, just around the um, statement there 
on your page, um, the seven catchments and the freshwater planning work stream are in various stages of planning and advisory groups are being established to discuss the freshwater policy option. Can I just have um, um, just looking at the last paragraph? 38 or 259. It's not page 19 in the documents. Second to last paragraph, the seven catchments. Yeah, can I just have some clarification around um, the establishment of those um, catchment groups, freshwater planning catchment groups on what the criteria is. Um, I just want to, I'm trying to ensure that there are actually people in those areas that are um, part of it and, and what, um, yeah, what, what's the makeup of those groups going to be, or the criteria for the makeup of those groups going to be. Through you, Your Worship, so the criteria that they have a local connection to the place, preferably that they live in Tairawhiti and either work, play, have um, interest in Tairawhiti. We were seeking membership that covered a range of interests and expertise and skill sets. So they have to have an interest in fresh water and, and somewhat of an understanding of fresh water. We were looking for people to represent the farming community, horticulture, forestry, cultural interests, recreational interests, environmental interests. Um, so there's a quite a diverse range of people that have been selected to cut across all those different aspects. We're still in the process of formalising those advisory groups at the moment. So there will, so there will be um, a, a good mix of people that are actually in those catchments, individual catchments on the rural agriculture. Yeah, that is absolutely the intent. And from what I've seen, that is what we have um, managed to create. Okay. And, um, yes, sir. And just one other question I've got um, on the freshwater side of it. Um, page um, 41, um, um, what's changing? Um, there's a statement here in catchments and, bio, um, catchments and biodiversity. The Ministry for the Environment has updated its policies which will have made fresh um, FEPs obsolete. Now, fresh yeah, environmental plan, farm environmental plans obsolete. Can I have... So there's been a whole lot of work done and farms have paid a lot of money getting farm environment plans done. And there's a statement here saying the Ministry of the Environment has updated its policies which have made fresh uh, farm environment plans obsolete. I, I struggle with that because um, it goes on um, to the new performance measures. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm a bit lost there. So, so is that true or because there's a whole lot of money being spent doing farm environment um, but so through you, Your Worship, that statement is a little bit strong. So the plans are not obsolete. They still have standing under the Tairawhiti Resource Management Plan. The government has brought in new regulations that mean there are now additional requirements for those um, farm plans. So they mean, may need amending, updating to meet both the provisions of the national regulation and our own local planning framework which we will change to, ref to reflect and synergize um, better with the national regulations. They haven't yet taken effect for Tairawhiti either. Councillor Thompson, thank you. Uh, yeah, just on page 34 in relation to drain wise, um, they're saying they're gonna target areas to Hartford Alden CBD. Um, my understanding was Kaiti area um, was the worst, and that was the area we were targeting first. Um, so I yeah, suggest that area has been done, um, but we're still releasing into the rivers. I'm just wondering how successful that this program's program's been. Through your worship, we have undertaken a large amount of work in Kaiti catchment. However, there's still a lot to go. Um, last week's event showed us there's a number of issues over into Harpura, Elgin, um, all the way to Whatau Koko. So we've got a large number of issues that we're still dealing with across the district. The challenge with drain wise will always be the length of time it takes to undertake the repairs on private property. But we have, as we've reported the operations previously, the volume of water that we are able to have into the network or rain 
before we have to respond has gotten far better in the last five years. It used to be around 25 mils of rain would tip the system over. Now it's well over 100 that we can handle before the system falls over. So we're working through the wastewater management committee to try and put some proper metrics around that rather than just the rainfall data. But DrainWise has been successful where we've undertaken the repairs. It's just we still have a large amount of work to go. It is a 10 year program. Just, just supplementary, um, yeah, there's mention of people putting their stormwater into sewage, but I, I'd suggest there's also a large issue with cracked piping and water seeping in. Um, is there any work in regards to that? So through your worship, there's a number of issues that we have with across the drain waste network. So when all of the studies that have been done in the independence have shown that the first flush that we have inside Afidi, the issue is direct um, injection of stormwater into the system, which is your downpipes and those sort of things. Secondary, there is an issue with cracked laterals that run from the property through to the house. Council has its own replacement program where we're going through lining pipes, replacing pipes, which you have underway at the moment. We're now looking at what are the issues and how can we resolve them on private property? And that's part of the DrainWise enforcement program that the Wastewater Management Committee has been looking at the last couple of years. Thank you. Any last questions before we wrap up? Councillor Elder, you have another question. Go for it. Um, so page number uh, 32 on the Waipoa um, rebuild. Um, I believe there is um, 4 million plus 15 million has been granted to the region for that. Correct me, I know those numbers aren't quite right. I, one, I'd like to know how much has been spent already. And um, <clears throat> secondly, um, looking at these notes associated with it, I really think we need to go back and have a whole new look at it, maybe get a new set of expert eyes on it. For example, the retreat and rebuild of the stop bank downstream of the railway bridge, um, that had obviously been put in the wrong place and that's why it blew out. Um, and in light of the flooding, um, on the TRI, oh sorry, I should have declared an interest here in that I am affected by the TRI flood. Sorry about that. And also the Tikaraka stock bank priority, whether this what's left of this money can be prioritized into other areas. Um, thank you. Mr. Wilson, thank you. Three of worship. There's a number of issues just raised there. I'll try and cover all of them. So the first one around the funding, the funding that we've had from central government is all but spent. I think we're down to our last 240,000. We've just invoiced them for, for the funding of works that was done to date. The first injection of cash from the Provincial Growth Fund, which became Carnor, that was to speed up the works on the city side of the Waipawa flood control scheme, which we have now completed. So that funding bracket that we have had is gone. The funding that we have is the funding that's in the long-term plan, which is to roll out the Waipawa flood control scheme in the affordable manner that was set by council um, back in the day. The, we have also made um, presentations through the recovery team and the recovery plan and to Kanor to help speed up the Waipawa flood control scheme again, similar to how it was done last time. So we've given them a program for speeding up the Waipawa flood control scheme also looking for funding to include upstream of Tikaraka as part of the protection work. So that has been something that we have already flagged for funding from central government. So that has sat there. Regarding the Tiaroi catchment, um, as Councillor Alders aware, there are issues if we look at a scheme for the Tiaroi as to what knock-on effect that has for that entire catchment, but also the Waipawa catchment, just given the nature of the terrain there. And it'd be a very difficult scheme for us to implement, but. It's something that is part of the TRI and the Waipawa catchment plan reviews that Joe Noble and her team are looking at. That is something that could be done for consideration. The last part of that, the piece that was hit at the bottom um, of the catchment, uh, right at the very end, that was quite new works. So that's covered by insurance. So the work that was happened there, we were concerned about the flood bank where it was at a high velocity area, which as you can imagine at the mouth of the river, high volume, high velocity. We were concerned for that because it was quite green work. So it had only been done a few months prior. So we were worried about that being impacted and it was. We've reviewed it, we've had independent assessments, we're comfortable with that remaining where it is, it's in the right place for protection of the river mouth, but also the landowners that are on that side of the river, that's around the protection that we've designed and agreed for with them. Kia ora, thank you for that. Okay, councillors, we've got a massive piece of paper in front of us.
There's one correction to just what Councillor Foster pointed out under 2B. It should read, agree that the expenditure noted under 2A. So that is just a correction there. Do I have a mover? Moved by Councillor Foster, seconded by Councillor Farihanger. All in favour? Contrary, is carried. Yeah. Okay, we are going to our paper setting of rates, page 134. As you can see, this is not really a report. Every single piece here is a recommendation. You can see that that is for admin purposes as, um, and this is also what you would see on your rates when they, they calculate certain inner zone, outer zone rates, or if you live on a horticultural block or lifestyle block. Any questions of staff in regards to paper 23130? Councillor Cranston, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, firstly, I'd like to declare a possible potential perceived interest. Um, and that's the fact that my daughter's property is under threat, but it hasn't been sticked at this stage. Um, I've, because of that, I've had several meetings with people that are in a stickered situation and uh, been involved in quite a few meetings. So I get a pretty good understanding of what's going on there. Some, a meeting we had midweek, someone asked the question, uh, what's happening uh, with rates with a red sticker property? Now we've got properties that are falling down the hill and their future is a skip bin. Uh, that's absolutely their future. There's no way around it. Their property and million dollar plus properties, they're going into a skip bin and they asked what's happening with rates. And they were told that, oh, your probably best avenue is to fill out a hardship grant. So I went online and had a look at the hardship grant and it's along the lines of how much do you earn and what's your, why are you in hardship and all this. And it's onerous on someone that's now renting a property for $800 a week, still paying a mortgage on the property that which is going in the bin and it's got no future. They've got no services. They're not getting rubbish. They're not getting toilet uses that. I think our situation with a red stickered property should be absolutely, the day they are red stickered, their rates are stopped. And we don't need a process for that. It can be attached to the red stickering of the property. We don't need them to put an application for hardship and all that sort of thing. They're red stickered, they've got no future in that property, they've got no services on the property, it's red stickered, your rates stop as of today. And that's the least we can do because the bank's still telling them they've got to keep paying their mortgage, you know? So I would like to propose that red stickered houses don't pay rates from the day they're red stickered. Um, for your worship, we've been doing a bit of work in this space already, having a conversation around what that might look like, just so that we're aware of what the full implications are. In the meantime, the team have been remitting the rates. I'm not sure whether Bice came for to fill in a hardship grant, but maybe we can pick that up offline. I don't think it needs to be dealt with in terms of setting the rates report. But what we do need to do is bring back a, a, some advice around that, because it's the other conversation was, well, we could possibly remit part of the rates um, or do you want 100%? So you need some options, but also need to understand the implications of doing so because we understand from Christchurch um, when they went through having to remit well, the, the totality, although we're not in that situation yet, although our category threes are, our red stickers are rising, um, that does have some implications cost-wise. But in the um, but meantime... Equally, people are, are impacted and what the team have been doing have been remitting rates. Yeah, I don't want to be critical of staff, but that advice came through a public meeting on Wednesday. So, yeah, so it just would be great if everyone's talking talking the same and that advice is, yeah. Thank um, you, sir. But as far as getting further advice and that, how long is it going to take? I mean, these people are stressed today, not... You know, what can, can free, we make a decision yeah, soon so, on it? So, free risk, anything is red sticker straight away. We have uh, remitted um, that for the last two quarters um, that came through. And then, um, when it comes to the new quarter, we, we would be assessing those. Um, if there's no changes, we'd do it by a quarter by quarter basis. Um, and so, 
that's fine. You just need to be letting the, um, the team know and they will consider those kind of things. But there is long-term ramifications that we have to consider. And that is um, how do we do deal with this and, and how are the different situations. So if there are other things that for argument's sake, um, properties are purchased out by under the proposal or anything that comes through there, um, immediately council's contribution to that um, that's written off, is that taken into account because we've remitted those rates and then there's a benefit um, for, because the, the value of the property is at market rates. And so therefore there are considerations, but we're definitely um, uh, looking at each by case by case. So there is uh, remitting those ones in the red stickers and probably for the next quarter. So we've done it already for the last two. Um, we will assess it on a case by case basis. And that happens automatically as opposed to a separate one, which is a hardship, which says in exceptional circumstances, which was regards to land and the ability um, to, uh, is impacted with it. So there are two circumstances. Councillor Robinson, thank you. Um, thank you. I, don't, I hear what Councillor Cranston is saying, but it is a, a difficult process. Because if you have a red stick at home that has actual functional land that could still be adding value and producing or stuff like that, then um, that would arguably be remit would be rateable land. And so it's not just a, a one glove fits all approach. Um, but so you're saying that all red stick properties have been remitted for the last two periods? Okay. And uh, when do you think we might have some sort of real template or, you know, um, you know, checklist as to really how we how we move forward. But to, and, and I, I actually want to acknowledge your point you might raise, Pauline, about the value add because if these properties are bought back or, or bought out, and council is contributing fifty percent, then the homeowners are going to receive um, a significant payout. And, and it's not it's not going to be necessarily what the homes were worth, but at the end of the day, um, that that load sharing is going to be borne by others in the community through our subsidy. And so we are still obligated to try and recover as much as we can in the situation. So I'm just going to move us on from here. I just um, realised it's such an important discussion and it was raised. The paper in front of us, now, and, and these are offered to take it on offline as well. Can we just for now focus on what is here and then we can get, there's a commitment from staff to bring it back to us. But in the meantime, we know that red sticket properties are automatically given a, a, a remit and we'll follow up on the information provided as well, Councillor Cranston. Any more questions about the paper? And Councillor Foster, thank you. Thank you, guys. One page 143, um, long LTP proposed a limit of overall rate revenue increase of 6.5% plus growth. Um, you know, and um, it, the growth is 0.57, which actually makes the increase 7.2%. Um, but you know, my question is, what's growth? What, what, yeah, and that's ambiguous. I mean, it could be <laughs> we could be saying agreeing to six point five percent plus growth, and that growth could be, um, um, you know, yeah. What, what, what's the growth? The, the growth is actually an actual. It's not an arbitrary figure. It's based on um, what is the rateable units that have increased since the other time. So it's people that are we we're saying that they didn't have a base rate to have an increase the previous year. There are actually new subdivisions. There's new things that are coming on there. So growth is yeah. So that, why, that's growth. Why down further? There's um, growth is zero point five. Is that um, from where we set the rates last year? to where we are now is actually calculated 0.57. So each year we will assess the actual growth from what it was to where, so if it's less um, than what it is, we can't, we don't um, plus growth. It's only on actually what is the growth that is cute so from that last time. So the 6.5%. 6.5%, yeah. Right, okay. Thank you. Okay, Councillor.
This is what we have discussed. Why did no one shout microphone at me? I always shout microphone at you. Um, so as we've discussed before, our hearings panel pool, there are some conflicts in there where people are involved and we need to make sure we have a pool of counselors that we can pull on. And just because it is an appointment, I need to write a formal paper just to, you know, how we do our committees at the beginning of the year. So we are adding to our pool, Councillor Ani Pahuruhuruwai and Councillor Rob Telford, which I move. Do I have a second, Councillor Robinson? And I, are you voting or putting your hand up? Oh, you've got a few questions. So um, there you go. Let's open it up. Yeah, well, I've just got a few issues with this. Um, yeah, so, so, for example, the Regional Transport Committee, you, you've got three or four members and, and they turn up every time. Um, you know, I don't see it very democratic um, where a chair can pick his committee based on what the, uh, what the topic is. I'm happy to have, have three members, first reserve, second reserve, um, but you know, like for example, I spent two days reading and then a the day before the committee, I was told I wasn't on, on the committee. Um, you know, I just think, and there's already, so in the, that they have three members um, for the hearing. So you've got a chair and two, you, you've already got six reserves there. Um, yeah. Oh, so I, can I clarify the process as I understand it and how I was part of it before and how I want it run? Because it is at the end of the day, one of the committees I appoint. How I used to operate is that there would be something coming up, which is a hearing. Then you say, who's available out of the hearings pool? It's an email sent to everyone. And I might say, sorry, I am in Wairua that day or... I'm away or I'm not available, then as a committee, you see how many people are available and you make it up from there. So that's what I want to see going forward is that we see who's not available, who has a conflict, and then with Heather's assistance, because we, there can be three people on the panel, but there could be five as well. Um, and I, I, uh, that's what I would like to see because we want a, a varied um, input as well. So um, going forward, we do have a big pool of people that we can pull on. So this is how I used to run the process and how I used to get, and, and sometimes we would only have two or three people, but sometimes there could be four or five or six on there. Councillor Foster. Um, yeah, just want some clarification because there has been an issue where it's been up to the chairman to decide a conflict. I mean, most other times when people determine their own conflicts, yes, I've got a conflict, but when the chairman says to someone, do you think you should have, you have got a conflict? If you don't agree with it, um, what's the process after that? At the end of the day, conflict sits with the person. Yeah, but the decision to make that person elevated to the mayor for the, meet for the committee, pardon? Elevated to the mayor. Elevated to the mayor, right, okay. Cool. Your Worship, um, I've been down this path. As I understand it, it is with you, if you feel okay sitting on that committee with a conflict of interest, that is up to you. If you want to vote on that committee, that is up to you. If that conflict of interest has resulted in you getting some advantage, you're in deep trouble. Unfortunately, it's not as simple as what you just stated, because often there are perceived conflicts of interest where there is no pecuniary, pecuniary interest to you. Um, so I hear what you're saying. You make it sound very simple and in principle and in practice, it should be that simple. It is not. So again, we have had workshops around conflicts of interest with the Office of, of the Auditor General. There are clear guidelines we have staff that can guide you if you struggle or you do want some feedback on that. I just want to stipulate it is very important. Conflicts are not just something that you think about or it is really important because a choice or a funding agreement or can, can absolutely tip over if you are part of a hearing where an organization 
um, then pick up on that and in the end it can become a big lawsuit. So even though we try to simplify it and equip ourselves um, with as much as possible, please reach out, please ask Heather and James and the team to support you because what we want is to be safe, for our councillors to be safe, but what we ultimately want is a balanced approach on all our committees where our, committee, our community can know someone that speak on my behalf or has listened to me does not have conflicts that can maybe jeopardize the process. So it is complex and it is simple, but it is not. <laughs> Councillor Farihinga. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Just, to, just in support and to qualify uh, um, uh, my statements, um, I am a an RMA hearings qualified chair. Um, so the, the, the lens in which we have to conduct hearings is, is really, really specific. Um, first, in regards to conflicts, if we, uh, if we can read or refresh ourselves under our standing orders, it's 20.7 and 20.8. 20.7 is financial conflicts, 20.8 is non-financial conflicts. Both actually ob obligate us as councillors to remove ourselves from, uh, from those um, decisions. But in regards to hearings, there's this overall process, this overall value of natural justice. And it's the justice that our community needs to be able to feel from us. So the thing we, we need them to feel after they've come and submitted to a hearing is that I was actually heard in the, and, and for us not to be sitting there and them being able to perceive that there's a conflict, that they can actually look at us and go, everyone that's at that table, Yep, there's nothing here that would have gotten interrupted. That. You know, that there's, that, that's the thing that we don't want our, our community to do. You know, that we don't want them sitting there and, you know, I'm a really passionate boxer, right? That there was something that had to do with where uh, the boxing club was located. Obviously, if people were against that and I was sitting on that hearing, then they would go, oh, of course Josh was going to vote that way because he's a, he's a boxing judge. He's boxing, all of that kind of stuff. That That's... That that's the perception that we need to give to our community. Um, is this an opportunity for us to have more fuller discussions about who, what, when, and where? Mm. Yeah, we are pro probably. Um, but that's kind of that higher rationale. It's around natural justice for our community, for our community, not only feeling that they're being heard meaningfully by faces they recognize on those hearings, but also feeling like they're not being heard or prejudged against by other faces that are on that. On it here, and happy to have more conversations like this uh, with our, especially with our newer councillors, more than happy to do that. Good luck. Thank you. Councillor Tupara and then Councillor Robinson, thank you. <clears throat> I think I feel for uh, particularly Councillor Thompson on uh, decisions being made on my, my behalf and whether or not I'm um, capable or able to be on, on the committee. And I find that very disturbing. Also that um, I'm made to be available on a committee because I carry a particular characteristic, which hasn't been determined by me, but by somebody else. And that goes back to being, we need to get a Māori on the committee. So we'll appoint the Māori. And I find that offensive. Um, I also find it offensive that I'm not considered for committee because I have somebody else's perceived um, thought that I have a conflict. And um, I find that disturbing. Also, um, I am completely conflicted as a Māori from the Taira Fiti in every hearing. And um, if this is, is an issue and continues to be an issue, then I can't see that I can rightly have my name down as a committee member. If this is going to continue to happen in this manner, I need to step off because I'm not going to have my interests determined by another party in my community. And for every um, point that Josh pointed out in terms of being the face to represent that community, if every time there is a panel selection and others are making determinations for me, I don't feel it's safe for me to be on that panel. <coughs> and based on that, I wish to withdraw my name. You have two other very fine candidates putting their names forward. They're welcome to it if, if that's the way this committee is going to function. Councillor Robinson. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as you described at the outset, your previous experience with how this committee runs is how the committee runs. There is a pool of councillors available for any particular take. And uh, my job as the chair is to look first up, a, as you know, a, um, email of interest, expression of interest, availability is put out. People then indicate through Heather their availability, their interest to sit on a pool, on a, on a um, hearing. And um, there's sometimes just enough people to make up, I think, what I think is a, um, an appropriate quorum, which might be three people for a hearing. Um, sometimes five people put their names forward. Uh, the hearings we've had to date, there's been three of them. My rationale for selecting who I've selected has been a balance of old heads, new heads, community um, representation, and personal knowledge and experience about those issues and the ability of those members to contribute um, and do the job really, really well. So I've applied my experience, um, my experience as a counsellor, my life experience, my 22 years of legal experience in addressing these issues because they are quasi-judicial and in appointing the, um, the, the committees. It's really unfortunate, Councillor Thompson, that you did spend that time reading a paper which did not have your name on the front, but in fact listed three other members as that committee member on the very front page of those 600 odd pages of documents that you read at that time of what was going on in your life. And that's really unfortunate, but okay. you were not chosen to be on that committee. And unfortunately, um, you didn't pick that up and you um, invested time at, an, at a time where you obviously wanted to spend time supporting your partner. Um, but that's how it works. And I'm happy with how it works. I hear what everyone's saying, and I particularly hear what you're saying, Councillor Tupata, um, and, and this is something moving forward, but I'm, I'm happy with the process as it stands. I'm happy with the way the Mayor has appointed it, and I don't see any particular strong reason why we should change um, the way the process runs at the moment. That's, that's so my may point. I suggest, as we have lots of new councillors as well, and as we try to upskill each other and make sure that we do have, say, all experienced councillors in a couple of months is not available for a hearing, that we allow for a bigger, um, not just three, if people are available, let them take part so that they grow their experience. So what I would ask in something which we can also take offline because it is, um, we're just talking here about appointments, but make sure there's clear communication so someone exactly know what's going on. Um, and Heather is there to help you as well. So I want to encourage the hearing committee to make sure we do have bigger numbers now, make sure we upskill and give our newer counselors who are eager to learn and be part of that process, the opportunity as well to grow their skill um, through all of this. Kapai? Are you really withdrawing your name? Okay, then I have to, do you want to reconsider? Okay, you'll give it a reconsideration. For now, I'll ju we'll just do the appointment. Thank you for reconsidering. So at this stage, what's in front of us? Far out people, we are kind of yeah. going everywhere today. What I'm asking of you with a show of hands, Withdrawn. Thank you. So at this stage, what I'm going to ask you to put your hands up is that we add Councillor Telfer and Councillor Ani Pahuru Huriwai to our pool of hearings councillors. Hands up. Oh yeah, against. Thank you, carried. Thank you for that, councillors. Okay, next, where are, okay, so now I wanna to talk to you about remits. Luckily, everyone is sitting down. If you don't have a coffee, grab your coffee now. I'll just quickly talk through this process because we haven't had the opportunity for me just to quickly, and me not write a seven page email. So I'll quickly walk you through how this works. As we move, so each council is part of a sector or a different area. So we are part of the regional sector. I'm the deputy chair of the regional sector. That, those are all unitary councils and all regional councils. So we are part of a group there. But then we're also part of zones. You start at the North Auckland, um, Northland Bay zone one. 
Then zone two is around Topo, Topo, those areas we used to be part of zone two. But then when we were moved with um, Hawke's Bay into um, water services, I officially asked that we move into zone three. Okay, and then as you go down the country. So each councillor part of different groups, then councillor Telfer also represents us on regional and rural groups. So we're part of lots of groups. Councillors have uh, problems that are similar to all of them. And this is then when they report those, council those issues to local government New Zealand to look at the overall impact. Each council don't wanna fight their own fight. And remember, we did that um, last year or the year before when we took the forestry rating query, which councillor, ex-councillor Warsnop um, wrote on our behalf, because that is something affecting everyone. So in the last couple of months, you would have seen the odd email coming through saying, can you please support our remit? So that is not official support ask. That is just everyone in the zone reaching out to their zone members because you cannot put a remit forward if five of your partners don't support it. So some of you responded to some of the remits I send on, but before I even had answers, you could see the people had their five anyway to move it forward. What has now happened, those ones that came, some came through via email, but some not because we're not in their zone, they have now been looked um, at by a panel at local government New Zealand to, and there are certain criteria. It needs to influence all councils. It's something that's relevant to all councils. There are certain bars, has it been um, uh, put forward before? So now we're in that process where all these in front of us today, this 11, are going to be presented to all mayors at the local government conference at the end of July. What we are going to do now, and we're gonna step through each of these very fast, is where you're gonna give me a rough indication of how you feel about the remit. This is not a voting as such. If you want it to be voting, we can go there. Usually we get a good understanding. Yep, we all, um, touch base, uh, we all agree with this or we don't. And so what I'm now going to do is, get, does the Gisborne District Council want me to vote yes or no on the day at the local government conference? What then happens if they pass, then local government investigate those on behalf of their partners. Debbie. Thank you. Just... Um... Does anything happen as a result of this? Because, you know, I saw the ones a few years ago and I don't yep. really see any result of that. So you know what I'm going to do, if I can find it somewhere, at my last local government New Zealand board meeting, and I will get that and discuss it with you next time. They looked at every single remit for the last 10 years which ones have been retired, which ones were followed up, which ones um, changed because legislation changed. So absolutely, Councillor um, Gregory, local government New Zealand tidied those up and I will make sure I get those to you. Thank you. Councillor Telfer. Yeah, just, just have clarification. Um, page. Um, 149 here. It just um, in the summary, um, it just says that, that um, the LG NZ remit screening committee sent um, this the remit sent by LG NZ on the 7th of June, attachment one. Was that sent to us on the 7th of June? What page are you on? Sorry, I missed that. 149. Okay, let's just in the summary, this head of the summary. It just says that, um, yeah. The first page. The first page. So it just says. Councillors ask for civil remit sent by LGNZ. So I don't know, he is in charge the of that. Of June, all I'm asking is if, is if these remits were sent, were they sent to us on the 7th of June? No, no. No, all the remits were sent. Um, did you receive them? No. Let me ask that you receive them. Let me take a look at my emails on the 7th yeah, of June. And then they like must have that. just sent them through to... 
No, but to you or to councillors individually? Okay, no, so it comes to the system yeah. and then goes into our next agenda. Yeah. Okay, I'm just, yeah. I'm just wondering for future, just for future, mm -hmm. something like this where we're required to um, you know, approve or, or how we're gonna vote, <coughs> if it's come then, could it be sent out, could this information, it probably goes on to other things too, be sent out if it's available, be sent out to us prior to the meeting so that we can actually go through and read it and then when it comes up and we're actually a bit more informed because um you know look I, I personally don't see anything here that i'm alarmed about mm -hmm. um, and probably i think that they've been brought forward by different councils for legitimate reasons so i didn't see anything in there that just sent alarm bells to me but I, i'm just wondering whether or not we've got more time then to read it read them and consider them and whatnot and then we come turn up to a meeting which we've only had the agenda you know a few days before we've actually had time to make an informed informed decision that's all I'm thank you for that and we'll pass that on to miss con um did you not get your agenda last friday no but i think what rob is saying what councillor kelfer is saying um yeah. something like this if, if there's something that comes quite a, a little bit in advance maybe for us to consider flicking it out even though i know that staff first need to check and write a report on yeah, top yeah. of it yeah anyway note it okay councillors are you ready yeah. let us go we at our first one allocation of risk and liability to the building sector i 100 percent agree yeah. thoughts yeah. Nodding. If you don't, I, I might say my, no, I will not say my opinion first. <laughs> it's open. Tell me what you think. I okay. totally agree. Great. Okay. Now we'll just see how it goes. Number two, am I the only one that thought this is wrong? If you read the first one, it should say lower the income threshold for rates rebate eligibility to enable more low and fixed income property owners access the rebate. I don't mean raise as raise discussion. You know what I'm trying to yeah. say there? I, am I the only one reading it like that? Heather, we might need to feed back to them and say, shouldn't it be if you want more people to qualify, you lower the income threshold? No. no, no am I reading it wrong? Yes. wrong. Okay. No. Okay, great. Oh, thanks, guys. I will remove my little note then. Anyone disagree with that? Colin. A question around it. What out of interest is our rate rebate as a dollar value or a percentage? Pauline, thank you. So this is a central government rates rebate. Okay, so it happens automatically, and this is why they're asking um, that if people have that threshold that they can get a rates uh, rebate. So it's effectively um, for a single person, it's 28,000 currently as the income yeah. and in which they can get a maximum of about $700 for the rebate off their rates. Um, as a household, uh, it's 50K. Um, and then the, again, a maximum threshold is $700. Uh, okay. So do, do we know the actual value of our rate take that is coming directly from government is what i'm asking what right take comes from government it comes from people yeah no no we just get it reimbursed it's mm. um we can just uh i think we give it in the uh, finance and performance i come back mm. to you where we says how many rates rebates um have been uh processed so far so, so in finance and performance yeah. every now and then we do any um people agree with this one number two Okay. Cool. All good. Three. Absolutely agree with lifting up. Three. Uh, okay. If you don't, if, yeah. Roading transport maintenance funding. Yes. yes, please. Do you you feel like clapping? Okay. Number four. Yep. Fine. So we're not enlisted in that supported by at the moment because we haven't seen. Because how I run it yeah. is if I get stuff and I can see five people already. I wait for the official endorsement with my councillors. So we will, once the real voting happen, mm -hmm. we will support it. And we'll be in there. Yep. Come on. So those that you see there is just people that replied back to the email saying. 
Local election assess accessibility, those were for people with disabilities yeah. and also being able to access the funding there. I've got no issue with that. Any issues? We move to um, number five, co-chairs at formal meetings. We already do that, our, in, or our uh, Andy and Larry. So we support that. Anyone wants to speak against that? It's just not formally written. No. Six, parking infringement penalties. That you can set your own penalties and not be tied down by government. I um, um, wouldn't mind that. Councillors, all good. Rural and regional public transport. Number seven, that's page, am I moving too fast? 173. Um, calls on the government and opposition parties to commit to increasing investment in public transport for rural and regional communities to support access to essential services. Okay. We move on to eight. Are we watching what they're doing? Because it looks very interesting. Watching who's what? What, what Waikato are up to with that um, uh, public transport. I, um, just a comment that it, it you will have to ask that of the Chair of Regional Transport, Ani Pahuru Huriwai. <laughs> I don't have the answer, she'll be watching. Okay, we are on at page 176, establishing a resolution service. That I think is, is something which we have spoken about before, where there are codes of conduct and it never works nowhere. So maybe looking at something a bit more smarter might work. Okay, nine, earthquake prone buildings. Yes. Councillor Cranston, thank you. Yeah, just, um, I'm not for or against it, but I do want to just put a word of caution out there. When I first got on the council, probably 18, 19 years ago, it seemed like these properties had a age to get stuff done. The concern now is we've got to the end of that age where they were supposed to have done something with their buildings. So we do need to keep in the back of mind that it's a health and safety risk if they don't get on with the work. So the, the time period that they've had to do the work, what seemed considerable when we first said it, but now <laughs> sitting here through that time period, we've got the end of it. So I think if we are um, sort of talking about that, we do need to put the caution out there that we can't go for another 10 years or something because it's a health and safety risk. You know? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Also, the concern that we have um, in, our, in our town with those five buildings that are, that are um, earthquake prone but owned by a person in prison. So, we oh, are going yeah. to. <laughs> yeah, there are lots of complexities yeah, in there, a, and I know there's some stuff so happening behind the scenes. We don't want to be, yeah, be mm. promoting something that's. Um, yeah, that well, I think you know, overall, like, we overall, need to. Overall, the, the concept is. Yeah. yeah. Okay, moving on to page 182 which is KiwiSaver contributions for elected members. Any issues there? Last one. I'm sure everyone will agree with this. Audit New Zealand fees. Thank you, Councillor Elder. Um, so I don't think we should cut back on any auditing. Um, I think we're fees. responsible for all the funds that we manage. It's not about cutting back on auditing. It's audit fees that we want better value for our fee. Well, I agree with that. So long as it doesn't, so long as it does not compromise the auditing process. I 100% agree with you. Okay, councillors. Now, I'm, let me tell you what a bunch of winners. Sometimes this can take so long, and this has been really, really straightforward. So, I also just say, Councillor Ria, Councillor Telfer is not there that day yet. You only fly in that afternoon, I think. But um, Councillor Ria is going to the Timarawata. Um, AGM that morning. So if I am unable to attend, Councillor Ria will vote on our behalf. Kapai? We are on page 150 and 151. Um, there are those 11 remits and then number two appoints Councillor Ria as the alt alternate voting delegate. Hands up because it's a person. Thank you. And all in favor, no. contrary, carried. Thank you for that, Heather. So we have already done 
our water entities paper. Thank you for that, Yvette. Nadine, we move on to your report. Yes, thank you, Through Your Worship. So just a um, an overview from all the teams across the organisation in terms of what's been going on, which has been lots. So we'll just open up for questions and the directors are here to answer any questions from the areas as well. You want me to break it up? Or are you quite happy it's to take a look? It's probably easier to take it and, and break. So I'm going to break it up. Otherwise... This massive first part called Central Government Updates, which is heavy reading, and that will take us right through to page 208. So we talk about three waters reforms, which we've already touched on, Future for Local Government, Trifecta Program, RMA, waste legislation, and these are just updates. So if you, I don't expect questions on those, but please do not stop me from asking or requesting more information. Nadine. Sorry, I just, um, when the report came out last, oh, the chief executive report came out, we also received the Future for Local Government uh, recommendations, which have been attached. Uh, we will come back and have further discussions around what, what will happen. I mean, I think there's an election in between, so it's hard to see if anything's going to be moving um, in that space. And we also have had some um, feedback in terms of key changes for, in regards to the RM reform from the select committee, and um, we will circulate those separately. That hasn't been um, attached due to timing of the report. Up high. Now we move to page 209, which is our council plans and policy updates. You can also see the massive amount of work happening there. And this just reminds me to pay my dog registration when I see that. Thank you. Okay. If there's nothing there, Nadine, I'm going to ask for a civil defense update. Oh, okay. Yep. Just with the sandbagging um, the machine and everything, I was just wondering, was there any sand of those sandbags that were made? Was there any used over the last weekend or so for um, you know, for protection? What protection? Uh, my understanding is that they were in hot demand, very much so that we've got bought the machine we're trying to get the machine and we might have the machine back in so we can run another day so that people that didn't get out and come down to the beach to collect their sandbag can come and prepare Sorry. again yep Good. we've had quite a few requests but i have spoken to I've, I've walked the cbd and a few businesses that i know around town that has had some issues and they are really grateful and i also want it's the RRT, the Rapid Relief Team, I think, who's also offering uh, that process. So real community effort to try and make sure those properties that see flooding every now and also those businesses um, are ready when, um, when it happens. Just in, um, touching on the sandbags, were any of those sent up the coast? I just remember seeing some people that were looking for sandbags at some point. My understanding is that they were. I believe that um, they, there were quite a few deployed after the last event up the coast. How mm high? -hmm. Oh, Councillor Older, thank you. Oh, thanks, uh, um, Speed management plan. I hope the council has taken some notice of the Wellington Council and their two hundred million um, dollar attempt to slow down traffic, and then they discovered there was a, there was a, an addition mistake that uh, made the whole lot wrong. Um, the um, toilet block, is that, it says there's just one toilet. Does that, that kind of... Oh, that was like, you know, when you sorry, want to swap stuff, you need to say, ding, because then we know you move on to another subject. Um, 219. 19, 219. Sorry. 219. Miss Frey, thank you. The... Um, resurrection of the toilets and it just says that one toilet will be available but 
Let's Christian just hear what Ms. Fry is saying. Uh, through the through your worship, um, so uh, the agreement was that we would strengthen the Kill Street toilets. Uh, that was the core focus, and we had a set budget. And if possible, we would reinstate the toilets within them. Uh, we have been able to reinstate one. So a full refurbishment of the inside is for future funding. So we don't have the funding for the full refurbishment. <clears throat> one toilet. Okay. Um, and just one comment, sorry, still going, one comment on the roundabout um, versus lights. I, I personally preferred the roundabout. Thank, Thank you, you for your opinion on that. Okay, any other questions? Thank you. Jumping back to page um, 213 under the relationships co-governance mm -hmm. with Tangata Whenua, um, in terms of the steering group, iwi representatives, mm -hmm. um, whether or not we're fully representing all the iwi that are being given some rec degree of recognition through the Waitangi Tribunal. Although we're um, recognising iwi who have settled, um, also iwi who haven't yet, but we're not recognising iwi, other iwi who haven't settled yet. I'm wondering if there is a consideration for that in the near future. Yes, through your worship. So, and, and it's fair to say there's not been a lot of progress in this space anyway in terms of the um, actual set, setting up for the TRMP. So we can certainly review that as well. Any other questions on page 213 to 14? That's all work in progress. Yes, Larry. Just... Um... Oh, page 222. Uh, just wait a second. We were just two? saying we'll, oh. we'll move. Okay, let's oh. go. 215 then. General management. Oh. Thank you. Are yours in 215? 215. Yep. 215 oh, to 217 is the right, next section. Right, 215 to two. I just want us to move in a way as people raise questions, we move through. Okay, then focus projects 218, taking us through to right through to 225. 218 to 225. If there are no questions, Kapai, I just want to give people the opportunity. Councillor Foster and then yeah, Councillor Alder. Yeah, Te Panoku to Fare. I'm on top of Titirangi. I mean, uh, are we confident that we're going to be getting a consent by the end of the year for this to progress? For your worship, so this project, uh, we were in conversations with the submitters pre-cyclone, and uh, that obviously came to a, a bit of a halt during that process, but we have just recently had um, a meeting and are looking to uh, make sure that we have the meetings that we need to with the submitters and um, take that off hold in the near future. Right, so we should have a decision before the end of the year. I'm hopeful. <laughs> Councillor Alder, thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Page 255. Uh, clause... 255. 225, you mean? 255? No. Uh, so, so I'm at this stage. Two... I'm handicapped. That's you're not. You're not. It's 218 to 225 at this stage. Just talking about Sorry. focus projects, which is resource recovery center, pool development, community facilities, township upgrade, Panukutu Titirangi Summit, Tairafati Resource Management Plan, environmental science update. So just great updates overall. Um, so we just fill in that section. Anyone wanting to ask questions in that section? Councillor Cranston, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, page 235, Linear Park, Gray Street, Awata Moana. Um, that's another- Are you on page 235? <laughs> Councillors, I'm, okay. Anyone has got a question in the section that I have highlighted? <laughs> Because it's otherwise, it's just going to get too messy also for Nadine okay. to respond. That's what I'm trying to do is take us through sections. So hold your questions. Mm -hmm. Councillor Telfer, let's see how it goes. <laughs> Which page? Page 287. <laughs> <laughs> 218. Right. Yes. 218. <laughs> um, 218. Uh, on Woody Debris on beaches. Um, 
following our workshop in April, um, council's workshop in April, um, staff were drafting a council position considering the outcome of that workshop. Um, can I just have an update on where are we with that? Uh, th <clears throat> through your worship, the, the team have been working incredibly hard on this very complex topic, which is interrelated with everything else going on. So we do have a paper coming to the executive team first, um, and then we should be in a position to come back to council once we've, um, we've discussed that. So there is a lot of work that has gone on post our workshop with you, and a lot of thinking um, and reflecting on the information that you have provided us. Hi. Sorry, so, um, yep. so have we got a time frame on that when we could expect that back? So our, the, the work that our team have done is, is coming to a core uh, within the next three weeks or so, and then follow pending the outcome of that, um, it may be maybe eight weeks, uh, eight weeks away. Okay, councillors, I think it's safe to move I, I had one question. Does bathing waters mean swimming waters? Maybe. Yeah, okay. We move to page 226, which is biodiversity, which incorporates, um, which incorporates, page 224, which incorporates integrated catchment management, farm environmental plans, biosecurity. Any so questions? Councillor Farahinga and then Councillor Robinson. Uh, thank you very much, Your, your Worship. On page uh, 226, I just wanted to um, ask about the, if, if we're re-looking at revisiting, say, some of the planting plan for, for Waitangi in light of things <coughs> that have been moving under water, uh, oh, sorry, on land that is supposed to be land, but it's actually acting more like water um, in, in light of um, different areas of ours now starting to move um, and also specifically so under considerations and also under what, what's next also specifically in regards to are we rethinking planting poplars and willows uh, considering that we've already been having conversations about moving away from um, non-indigenous plantings in order to stabilise I'm wondering if like our our thinking is, is changing and adjusting in regards to that. So <clears throat> through your worship, so there's a lot of discussion about planting sites. So we've got a number of factors to consider, including um, slips and um, loss of plants, but also um, um, ETS liabilities and, and the other um, complexities around it. And the team are working very hard to make sure that we navigate that uh, and get the best plant in the best location um, for site. So priority, obviously, natives, but in some locations, poplars are an option. Uh, are, we, are we confident that the current plan of planting is considering that way not here, like as the gateway for way, you know, to <coughs> this park and it shifted so much before? And in light of recent weather events, things that we thought were going to shift action, things that we thought would have moved have moved. Um, uh, again, is that like, is that a big factor into the current, I guess, emergency parts of these places? But like, take for granted, we have to do something. You know, I'm just wondering what that practical next something might be. Is this the fact that you consider that? Uh, absolutely. So, uh, as I said, uh, real focus on what to do with some of those um, more slip prone areas. And there's also uh, drone hydro seeding options that are being considered at the moment. So really thinking outside the square in terms of how we get that um, land stable. So there's a lot, lot going on. Awesome. Thank you very much. Councillor Robinson. Um, sorry, to get late back in time, page 221 just talks about township upgrades. Um, several submissions in relation to the AP um, talked about upgrades for Ormond. What's our definition for a township to qualify for an upgrade? Through the chair, we've been discussing that particular issue and we'll have to go back and, and come back to you with some information on it on that. In relation to Ormond, that is considered to be 
a, um, uh, within the city boundaries, so um, should be covered through livable communities. Right. Thank you. That's a good answer. Anyone else? Councillor Cranston, your microphone is on. Do you have a question? No? Not, not just yet. <laughs> not just yet. Okay, councillors, let's move on. Our last one is our grant funding. It's not our last one, I'm lying. Grant funding. These are just updates on money. Sometimes we the conduit, sometimes we receive the money. We will see more and more of that throughout uh, the recovery period as well. So if you don't have um, any questions. Uh, just an inquiry. Um, in terms of the Creative Communities Fund, um, I'm, which I'm on the committee for, the, um, I note that we have very few applications and we do have a reasonably substantive fund to, to distribute. And I'm wondering whether or not um, we're restricted to just receiving applications to expend that money or whether or not we can spend some of that going out to the community um, to elicit interest in coming forward. Through the chair, we can definitely look at how proactively we can go out and um, get in applications for that uh, particular fund. So I'll have an offline discussion with you about that. Okay. Okay, regional roading activities. Where do we start? There's so much happening in that space, but that is on top of just the, this is walking and cycling, talking about the Uawa cycle way. That's the last bit. And then just right at the end of the report is just a future for local government summary, which I emailed to you, which is just a printed copy. Any questions or queries? Councillor Cranston. Yeah, thanks. Um, in the old days, we had a community development committee, which was all very exciting because we used to look at uh, the visions ahead of us for the city and how we would design it and that. So just looking at the linear park on Gray Street, I just wondered um, what sort of input we as council have to a project like that. Um, over the years, I've seen several plans about a corridor going down from uh, well, linking the river to the beach. And uh, yeah, there's been some planning around it and design uh, potential and that. But I, I know nothing about the linear park, Gray Street, Awata Morana. It says here, and maybe I missed it while I was away, it said that there was a uh, count, uh, meeting that involved councillors. So uh, apologies if I've, that happened during my um, absence, but I would really, it's something that I would jump on board with to try and get an understanding of. So just, um, uh, you know, it seems to be out of our hands. It seems to be in the hands of another organisation. And I really see it as something that council should be having input to, and it should be uh, someone with urban design expertise rather than a, a trust uh, that's just, you know, um, yeah, how are they mandated, I suppose, is the question. Through you, Your Worship. So at a high level, the linear park concept is included in Tarafti 2050, the regional spatial plan. In terms of the work that's underway now as part of the Streets for People program funded by Waka Kotahi, it's really an opportunity to test ideas. The idea is not that anything becomes permanent, but the thinking and the reaction that, that the trust working with Waka Kotahi and our staff elicits from the community will then feed into the more long-term planning, which is when it would come back to you as a council for consideration. And that more detailed master planning, urban design um, concepts would come into play as well if you decided it was something worth pursuing. So it's really an opportunity to, to play, if you like, without necessarily all the formalities and red tape that being a council-led project brings with it. Yeah, I just wouldn't like to see them get too far ahead and then it comes in here and we pull them back again. You know, I think it's something that everyone needs to work on together because it is an exciting concept of uh, our design of our city and that. So, I mean, it did say in here that you just need to go to their Facebook. So I went to their Facebook and there was nothing there. So I'd like to see that plan if, if it's available. So, yeah. I have Councillor Gregory, then Councillor Pahuruhuriwai and then Councillor Foster. 
Um, is that um, Linear Park, what the Tarawhiti Adventure Trust is doing? So they invited all councillors to a meeting in April, which was held on the 4th of May. Mm -hmm. And yeah. only maybe two or three of us were here for it. And they were asking for input. And um, it was fantastic, actually. It was amazing what they've got planned. And um, they also have proven their worth showing how they can do that um, pump track and the skate park um, really, really well. So, um, yeah, I think we have been invited. Thanks. Councillor um, Pahuruhuri, why? Just a question about the regional roading activities. I know there's been a whole lot more going on than the two. We're going to get a big update soon. Oh, After this paper, come into the air. Mr. Wilson's going to give us a big update soon Sorry. just to get us all on the same page. Okay. Foster to para. Just, yeah, just a quick one. It was just about the linear park. Um, yeah, it, was, it was a great concept. And the other thing is it's connected into the CBD revitalization, which has been on hold now because of um, Cyclone Gabriel and everything. And that's something that Trust Tarafati is um, involved with. But I would really like to see us involved with it as well. Like Andy was saying back in the day with um, community development, you know, all these projects would come to us and we'd see the transition and uh, you know, and, and follow them through until um, till the end. And um, you know, it was um, exciting. We could get the whole community on board at the moment. When you've got um, the smaller groups that are involved with it, the um, the community is not involved at all. You know, so but I see an opportunity here for councillors because staff are just absolutely tapped out with other staff. I see the opportunity what Councillor Gregory said earlier because Waka yeah. Kotahi funds this. Hey Joe, yeah, for councillors to actively reach out to Hey Mona and, and that yeah. trust and be because they updated us that day and it was um, and our staff are in there. But I do think councillors yeah. can absolutely yeah, reach out and, right. and, and ask questions and be part of it. So how, yeah, so how do we, I mean, I know, I know um, Private Means was supposed to come here in February with through Trust Tarafati, mm -hmm. he's a CBD mm -hmm. revitalization guru in the country, and he hasn't because of um, you know, what we've had in, in front. But I just, you know, I, I know we've got urgency happening, but there's also, there was good progress starting to happen behind mm -hmm. that, which is really vital for our CBD, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and I've to clear on interest, um, but um, yeah, to, but to see it just being put on hold now and with no indefinite um, outcome is, is a bit just. We can put that to Trust Tairawhiti because they are the ones that employed Purpose and are the ones doing that timeline. I know it was yeah. going to be the Thursday of the cyclone, yeah. so we can pose to them when that will will happen. I'll follow that up. Councillor Tupara and then Councillor Robinson. Thank you. Into page 236, the uh, Uawa Cycle and Walking Trail. Um, just whether or not there is any further consideration to some of our other communities, and this is not to diminish mm -hmm. the focus going at Uawa, um, but there is a rapid growth happening in our smaller communities with regard to housing. And um, particularly at Midiwai, for example, there's 10 new houses there, there's 17 new proposed ones for Money to Care. The number of houses at Wahiri there has almost doubled. Uh, way to he is um, substantially more. I, I wouldn't say it's double, but it's heading down that track with more houses to come. Um, and whether or not running alongside that should be considerations for how those communities get around um, themselves, uh, particularly um, in terms of not only cycle and walking trails, <laughs> but also um, rural traffic management in those areas. And there's still, um, that as the populate houses and the population grows, the speed limits through those, those particular spots are still the same. And um, now we have, particularly at Waitri and Waihiri there, probably 75% more children running around. And just some thought in terms of um, further, um, design and implementation to support those very rapidly growing communities out there. Oh yeah, just look, just to add my two cents worth in relation to the uh, Linear Park project, um, Councillor Farihinga and I um, attended the evening 
public presentation, spent a couple of hours with them, particularly in a long talk with the Waka Kotahi expert who had worked in Christchurch creating their linear park zone their, their, and, and the initial opposition by the community and then the complete uh, acceptance and celebration by the community of what they created down there completely um, like educated me and I'm so glad I attended it because it was um, totally value for money having attended it. So it's an exciting proposal and hopefully more information will come to us and I encourage any council who didn't attend um, to upskill them on this one because it's it's really great and it's funded by Waka Kotahi, so woohoo. Awesome. Any more questions? If not, is there a mover for Nadine's? Oh yes. I before we part, I'll, I'll move the. Do you have a mover and a seconder for the report? Thank you, Councillor Gregory. Seconded, at Council Farahinga. Mr. Wilson. So we just thought while everyone is here, get a proper update on the massive amount of work that's happening on our roading network. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. The floor is yours. You come, you come to the hot seat. Thank you, Worship. I suppose just quickly to update the committee on just the number of issues that we've got across the district when it comes to the roading network at the moment. Um, one of the things, and I am going to do a shameless plug, is the GDC website is the one source of the truth when it comes to our local roads and the condition of them. One of the things that's up there now is every single road that's out and it's updated every day from the council, uh, from the contractors as things come through. You can click on a road and it'll tell you exactly where it's out um, and it goes right down into the level of detail. If you click on that black spot, it's going to show you why it's out. When, we, when it was last updated, but then also what's uh, when it's going to be fixed and ETA is given on those sort of things as well. For the district at the moment, the big challenge we've got is obviously things are still moving. Um, Waka Kotahi is having the same issue on State Highway as well. So there is a very <coughs> real danger of actually being able to put our contractors onto sites to fix them. Um, and it is a serious health and safety issue. Been out on a number of these sites and they are still moving. You can literally see it moving and hear it moving while you're standing on it. Um, there's a couple of really big ones that I just wanted to highlight to you. So just to give you size for scale, that's the road down there. So the road is that small compared to what's fallen on top of it. Those rocks are massive. The other issue that we have is what's hung up in the top here. So all of that is yet to come down as well concern we've got when it comes to our contractors is we actually have to make sure that there's nothing else about to drop on them while they're there. And then also dealing with debris the size of those rocks that are there and breaking those up. So it's not a simple fix. That's up at Pihiri there. Pihiri, it's out to the west. So the other one that you've seen a lot is this is the slip on Tofari Parai. Um, this is the one at the 18K mark, so Doonholm slip. This is what it actually looks like from the air. So Uawa oh, Life, thank you. I've taken your photos because they're really good ones. Um, the road used to go around here. So that's the road down here now. So you can see that the road has been completely realigned from where it used to be. You can also see the size of that slip as well. So there's the car down there. So you can see the size and scale that we're working with here. Also, it's faulted right up at the top of the ridge there. For those of you um, familiar with the um, Mangahoeni slip in Tokomaru Bay, it's similar size and scale to what we're talking with there, just at the 18 on Doonholm. The other issue there is that lake that's formed um, just at the bottom there. Um, that is a concern. GNS are up there today looking at that. So when we're talking about the likes of Tofari, you can see that's just at the 18K mark. This is up the top. So this is up at about 37K mark. So it's quite hard to see here, but this is the slip going right across to here. So it goes right down. You can see the fault goes right down through here as well. So the road is supposed to be back up here. There again is the road coming around the bottom. So you can see how much it's moved with the material that's come through in and on that. So none of these are short-term fixes is I suppose what we're trying to show you. And it's a way for us to say this one here, for example, the local contractor who knows that area very well has been up there um, the last two days and they are not comfortable putting their gear anywhere near that because they said it's still moving. So the 
the steepness of it when you have a look at the videos of the teams that are actually on the ground but then you see how soft it is when you're walking on some of these things you cannot put a machine on it without risk of everything giving way again so for a number of these sites we've got real issues around access we've got issues around um, how are we going to be able to get two people so just quickly, this is the um, dashboard that Ben and the team in civil defence work to. So for those of you um, aren't aware, inside civil defence, welfare is the key one that's operating at the moment. We run off dashboards, things like this. So you can see how many households we've got cut off. You can see where they are. This all You can dive down into layers, and obviously I'm not going to do that for privacy reasons. But you can see, for example, we've got 21 out there at the moment that are requiring food. So we know that they're cut off. It's going to be multiple days before we get there. We've got two that need medical support. And that can be anything from medication that is required that needs to be dropped off, or that is someone who actually needs to come out for an appointment or surgery or those kind of things. Then you'll see we've got some animal assistance that is in there as well. That can be from we need um, feed so it could be dog food it could be hay but it could also be we've got far too many stock and we need to get them out because of the issues that we're having as well so with even little events like we had on the weekend the impact of those given the ground conditions are huge so we had about 92 roads cut off um, over the weekend we've got it down to about 50 at the moment there's still, however, 80 odd that we have massive issues on where things are seriously still moving um, and we may lose again. Because remember, even though we're all welcoming the sunshine, as things dry out, things will still continue to move as well. So any bit of rain, anything that we've got at the moment is a real concern for us. So I suppose the thing from me is, please, we need patience to be able to deal with what we're doing. We're taking it directly from our crews on the ground. If they're not comfortable going in, we're not telling them to go in because they've got a really good gauge because they're literally standing on the side. Um, I was up on State Highway 2 at the Otoko Hill on the weekend. You can literally hear it moving underneath you. You can hear water, but you can also hear it groaning and the trees cracking while you're there. That's very much the type of thing that we're working with across the whole district at the moment. So also I want to say thank you to the crews and the teams that are out there doing the work in very trying conditions. Happy to um, take any questions on that. We'll go, um, we'll go Councillor Tupato, Councillor Robinson, Councillor Thompson. Thank you for the update, um, Mr. Wilson. The, uh, and I think it's very thorough and it's, it's very um, uh, detailed in, in targeting where it needs to get targeted. I'm wondering whether or not given the longevity of um, the period we're going through and the, the, a number of events that are happening. And I see in there, there's a reference to who needs food and, and who needs medical attention, particularly on the medical attention, which as you, you suggest, um, refers to folk who need to access or have access to medications and things like that. Um, I believe there's a growing need for us to assess the, psycho the psychological um, condition of our community, that there are folk out there that um, need other than their clinical medical support, but some psychological support as well. And particularly in those small communities that have been um, hit quite heavily, who um, in the rural sector where um, psychological issues are, um, are often missed um, because of their location are even uh, more present now for those um, homes and those families, uh, given the longevity of, of our events. And I'm wondering if there is a, a likelihood or a possibility for a psychological assessment to be carried out in our community so that we can begin to identify where that need is and appropriate support um, offered out um, to, to those ones. So through your worship, psychosocial is one of the key aspects of welfare and part of the assessments that are undertaken at the way. So we are undertaking psychosocial assessments. Also, as part of the drop-offs that are happening at the moment, there are staff that go on those, particularly to assess how people's mental health is, um, and then looking at that. But we work very closely with Te Whata Water um, and other providers to um, around the psychosocial support we needed um, across the district. Also, um, with the Rural Support Trust, particularly for a lot of our farming communities as well, um, to make sure that they are in constant contact or that nothing's falling through the gaps. 
should I not? Um, through the chair, and also it's um, like one of the key things through our recovery is our collective impact approach, which is wraparound services for whanau, including psycho, um, psychosocial. Um, thanks so much, Dave. Um, how many, I mean, it's the dashboard I find a little bit hard to navigate. So, so, so inland of the 18K mark on Tofati Parai Road, how many people uh, are stuck and isolated in there? Uh, through your worship, there's approximately 50 up the top of Tofati. Um, when it comes to stuck, we have variable degrees of that in this region. It's quite a new um, thing for NEMA, I think. So it's very much around, can we get them out? Can they drive out? Um, can they get out on a quad bike or a side by side? I know the team are looking at a UDMOG, for example, to potentially do drop offs up in there of supplies. When it comes to a lot of these places, there is cross farm access for some, but it's around how do we actually get them proper access that they can come in and out and goods and services can start to flow as well. Uh, just in terms of allocating the work, is that given to the whoever's won the contract for each area? And I'm guessing, just looking at the work, you can't price it. It's it's all, all on charge charge up. And if, if we look at forestry with the bigger machinery, so through your worship. For each of the areas, the maintenance contractor has the bulk of the work when it comes to an emergency response. We work with them around who's adequate to be doing the work in those areas. So for example, at the top of Tofuddy, um, Kim Cranswick is up there. So Cranswicks are up there with their forestry gear. Uh, for the likes of Pihiri, I know that Fulton Hogan, that's their area. They're looking at who they're gonna utilize for what is the appropriate gear for those places as well. We work very closely with them as to which resource goes into which area, um, but they are the ones who manage the areas at this stage. Kapai, next person. Last question. Uh, no, Dave answered my question. All good. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Thank you. Also, I want you on behalf of council to extend the thanks to the people doing the mahi on the ground. It is tough out there. We do also do need to encourage the public to cheer them on and to be kind and follow the rules, drive slow, and also give them the opportunity. If they close certain roads, they do it so that they can do the mahi in there. So thank you for that. Councillor Pahuru Huriwai. Just a token for your sentiments. Mm. Um, your Worship, uh, um, and to thank Dave, but also Kate at Road Noise, who's been amazing um, with her regular updates on the local roading network, yeah. um, which has been appreciated by the community. So, mm -hmm. uh, and also Linda with her updates on the, on the um, state highways. That comms is really critical to um, stopping any um, stories being made up um, and um, yeah, and putting to rest any, any confusion over what's being said. So great to see the, the map and that that is the one true source of information when it comes to roading because it's often um, people are wondering what's happening with the roading network and going to Wakapotahi website and not seeing what they are seeing outside the doors. So um, that's, uh, that's really helpful. How often is that updated? Dave? At least daily. At least daily. At, at least daily. daily. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for that. We now move to our last paper. So what we're gonna all in favor, because we did have a mover and a second, I just didn't put it before Mr. Wilson started. Thank you. Thank you for that reminder. I take you to page 249, which is just another submission which um, Yvette will be sending in on our behalf. Yvette, anything you want to highlight there? Nah. So, yep, no, 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 you can, there's no rush. And then after this, we will break for lunch. Uh, Rachel, can you hear me? I just want to update you on new time frames because things yeah, are moving a little bit. So, um, kia ora and welcome. Kia ora, thank you. My plan is roughly after discussions with Nadine and Joe just to talk about times. 
is that we will break in the next few minutes. We will come back one o'clock when we will then um, have discussions with you. Nadine, yes, so if it, we'll, we'll break for the next 20 minutes. So one o'clock, what time, Joe, did you send through for the Just Transition stuff? So the MB staff do need to get the plane at 4 p.m. today. So they're flexible up until that point where they need to. Okay, no, that's good. So we'll airport. see closer to the time, maybe, because they only need half an hour, right? It's a yes, short. We've said to. Yeah. So the, the workshop will push out a little bit later to come to our public excluded stuff. So what we might do is come back 10 past one then to give, we've been um, here, just give everyone a break. So we'll break at 22. So Rachel, if you can be back 10 past one, that would be lovely. Perfectly. See you then. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. So page 249, councillors, is just a submission that Yvette is um, yeah. making again in a rushed uh, state. Yes. And I think we should highlight that again yes. in our submission, Yvette. Thank um, you. I think we've got a lot more time with this one, though. Uh, Good. So the, the, the Prime Minister has said that he is going to be recommending that the Select Committee take their time with Good. this. It's not dependent on pre-election um, sign off. Cool. So that's a really good thing. Um, right. We're going to know today if that's accepted. Um, it is going at two o'clock. It's the second <clears throat> item on the order paper for Parliament today. So we'll have, it'll have its first reading and then we will know when, okay. what the timing is. So I just wanted to let you know that I don't think there's any need for us. I, the paper is there to just give you a prime you for when I come back with, this, with the drafts on the show. Councillor Farihanger. Yeah, I'm happy to move. You Thank know, like you. this this paper is about that basically saying you're gonna come back to us with submission mm. points and like this yep. at our next council meeting in yep. like five, six weeks' time. So yeah, I'm, I'm more than happy to make the contents of this report. Seconded by Councillor Robinson. All in favour? Uh, Contrary. Carry. Councillors, what we're gonna do now, this is the end of our public meeting. We are gonna break for lunch, and I need everyone to be back 10 past one. Kapai, thank you everyone.